Hello everyone, welcome back to Ancient Greece and Rome. In this video, we're going to talk about daily life in ancient Rome. That is, the experiences of everyday Romans, both citizens and non-citizens, from about 27 BCE to about 235 CE. And we'll be bringing in artifacts and material culture to uh, discuss uh, the experiences of ev everyday regular Romans. We'll start by talking about Roman soldiers and the Roman military experience during this period. And we'll bring in archeological evidence um, in our discussion. We'll also talk about things like health and medicine in ancient Rome uh, because medicine would have been a big part of people's uh, daily lives. You know, people got illnesses back then, they got hurt back then, uh, just like people do today. We'll talk about uh, some famous Roman physicians and their discoveries, like Galen, for example, and that will give us a uh, bigger and better picture of health in the ancient Roman civilization. Then we'll use some case studies, um, life in various regions or provinces of the Roman uh, Empire, and we'll talk about the similarities and differences uh, people would have experienced based on where they were living in uh, the Romans, Roman em Empire. We'll look at uh, Pompeii and Herculaneum as examples of life in a uh, senatorial province in, in Italia, sort of in the Roman heartland where Roman culture is at its uh, strongest. And we'll reconstruct uh, the Pompeii residents' experiences, who they were, what their life was like based on the archaeological evidence has been left behind at uh, the Pompeii and Herculaneum sites. After that, we'll talk about life in the more remote imperial provinces away from the Roman heartland. We'll use a case study from Britannia, specifically the Lulling Stone Villa. And then we'll also look at some artifacts from Roman Egypt uh, as a case study for life in the far southeast of the Roman civilization. And what you'll see in these more remote provinces is there's quite a bit of cultural syncretism. A local regional culture is going to mix with Roman culture uh, and it's going to create its own kind of differing experience uh, than what someone uh, would have uh, experienced or been exposed to if they were living in the interior of the Roman Empire, in like Italia, for example. And the image on this slide is a golden glass uh, Roman uh, family portrait. It's from about the 300s uh, CE, so it's a little bit later than uh, the main um, focus of, of this lecture, but I still think it's useful in, in, in uh, showing what a Roman family would have looked like. A father, a pater familias, uh, with uh, presumably his wife, and then uh, a child, presumably their son. Um, we can date, um, Roman artifacts uh, with visual art on them based on the styles of the uh, subjects, based on their hairstyles, uh, based on their facial hair or lack thereof, based on their clothing. This is a little bit easier to do when you're uh, looking at visual art of women because women's styles tend to change more than men's do in the Roman civilization. So we'll begin our discussion of daily life in the Roman civilization by talking about the Roman uh, military in the early empire from about 27 BCE to about 235 CE. And there's advantages to serving in the Roman military. Military service provided stable pay, food, clothing, and health care for poorer uh, Romans. You had to be under the age of 45 to join uh, the Roman uh, military. You had to be young. But there are disadvantages as well. Military service uh, was uh, very difficult. Discipline was very harsh, um, which we'll discuss later. And there's restrictions on the kind of sexual relationships for um, that, that Roman soldiers can have. Augustus Caesar had forbade Roman legionaries from having wives. In order to join, uh, if you were married, you have to divorce your wife. But sometimes Roman uh, legionaries would have illegal uh, relationships with, with women and would even have uh, illegal uh, or illicit uh, children as well. But this was against regulation. Eventually this, this regulation will be overturned. 
Non-citizens would serve in uh, what were called the auxilia or the auxiliaries, and the auxilia would fight with a fusion of uh, local indigenous, but also Roman arms and equipment and tactics. Also, uh, non-citizens um, often served in uh, the Roman Navy as well. And by serving in the auxilia or the Navy, a non-citizen after 25 years uh, in the auxilia army and 26 years in the Navy, they could become uh, Roman citizens. They would receive a document called a diploma that would give them citizenship and would also give them an exemption from certain types of taxes that non-citizens had to pay. Uh, they would also, uh, auxilia, but also legionaries, would receive plots of land once they had been, uh, once they had completed their, their military service. And the Roman government gave this land uh, not for wholly altruistic region, reasons. One, it was a reward for service. It helped Roman veterans be independent. They could work as farmers. But two, these veterans, either legionary citizens or auxilia veterans, they would be loyal to Rome because they'd served in the Roman military for a large portion of their lives. And they'd be settled in parts of the Roman Empire that had a lower uh, population that was loyal to Rome. Basically, these were, um, they were colonizing and homesteading uh, parts of their empire, parts of the empire that were more likely to revolt. So it's not just about military service. It's about integrating other parts of the, uh, the empire as well when the Roman government gives out these land grants. And the image of this slide is a uh, Roman military relief from Gaul. Here are some images of Roman auxilia. This uh, auxilia is supposed to be a uh, Celto-Roman uh, auxilia, presumably from Britannia. He's using a uh, rounded Celtic-style shield uh, and the Lorica Hamada uh, chainmail. Uh, chainmail was uh, presumably a Celtic invention that was adopted by the Romans. He's armed with a spear and he has a Gallia helmet, uh, but he's also wearing uh, trousers and uh, closed in uh, boots. Uh, Romans generally didn't like wearing trousers. They associated them with uh, barbaroi or barbarians, but uh, they came to recognize that trousers were more practical in colder parts of the Roman Empire, like uh, Britannia, Northern Gaul, and certainly Auxilia, who kept more of their uh, indigenous traditions, they would have worn something like trousers to keep warm. We even think that some Romans would have started wearing trousers as well. And certainly Romans will begin to wear trousers really from the 300s CE on, but we'll, we'll talk about that in next, a later video. The slide also shows a diploma Diploma, of course, would have been a legal document given to an auxilia veteran uh, to show that he had successfully uh, served the Roman Empire. He gained citizenship for himself and his descendants, and he would also uh, receive land as a result of his, uh, his uh, service and a break on taxes as well. So it's a very important legal document that a auxilia veteran would want to hang on to. And then on the right-hand side of the slide is a cavalry uh, auxiliary soldier. This slide depicts images of Roman auxiliaries, modern reenactors, um, doing impressions of Roman auxiliaries. The left is a Sagittarius or an archer from the Middle East, and the right is a uh, auxiliary from the northern part of the Roman Empire. We see the auxiliary the auxiliary Sagittarius is armed with a bow and arrow, and the aux auxiliary from the northern part of the Roman Empire has a uh, oval-shaped shield that would have been used in that part of uh, Europe. In the center, we see um, archers or Sagittarii. Uh, this is from the Column of Trajan from the early 100s CE. Life in the Roman military was very difficult. You were sent to the far frontier of the Roman Empire. You dealt with the dangers of being in territory near uh, hostile barbarians, um, the privations that come with uh, military service, not being allowed to have a family, um, but the training and discipline that a Roman soldier would have dealt with in the Roman military was also uh, very harsh and very strict. 
potential recruits for the Roman legions would have to go through a uh, period of uh, training that's very similar to modern day boot camp or uh, basic combat training, um, what uh, modern uh, military recruits go through, after which they would uh, go on to being um, part of uh, their legion. And the training would continue once they had uh, reached their legions as well so that they could keep, keep their skills uh, strong and sharp. And there were many uh, punishments in the Roman uh, legions for uh, disobeying various types of orders or uh, not following your orders properly. And punishments ranged in severity. Uh, there were uh, less serious punishments like um, having your pay docked um, or being set to uh, like what we might call fatigue duty nowadays, digging latrines and things like that. Um, but... Um, Punishments could be more severe, including demotions and things like uh, public shaming. For example, soldiers could be uh, forced to stand uh, without wearing their belts. Uh, the belt was uh, not just military equipment to a Roman uh, legionary. It was a symbol of his uh, military uh, identity, the fact that he was a soldier. When he wasn't wearing his armor, he was still wearing his belt. It was also a symbol of his uh, masculinity as well. And to deprive a Roman soldier of his, of his belt was not only to say, you failed as a soldier, but uh, you failed as a man as well. In fact, Romans often referred to uh, smaller infractions of military discipline as uh, unmanly acts. Um, larger acts of disobedience also could be called unmanly acts as well. And more serious um, infractions of military discipline um, could lead to things like corporal punishment, uh, whippings and beatings. And these were designed not only to cause pain, but to shame uh, the soldier that had violated orders. But the worst punishment that um, a Roman soldier could endure um, was capital punishment, being executed. And Roman soldiers could be executed under certain circumstances. Decimation was one circumstance under which Roman soldiers could be executed, and this would occur if a uh, military unit, whether it was a cohort or even a legion, if they had um, disobeyed orders in battle or had had a mutiny against their commanders or had shown cowardice in battle, uh, one-tenth of uh, that unit would be killed. And then the remaining troops in that rebelling unit, even if they themselves had not rebelled, they would be uh, forced to sleep outside of camp where they were more likely to be killed by the enemy. Soldiers could also be killed for falling asleep on guard duty uh, in hostile territory. And um, the idea was if a soldier fell asleep on guard duty in hostile territory, the enemy could infiltrate the camp at night and kill the unsuspecting sleeping soldiers. So for um, infractions where the soldier's um, failures had, could have put his comrades in danger, he would actually be beaten to death by his comrades in the uh, public, in the public military grounds where um, basically he would be made an example of for failing to follow his orders. There's also reports that soldiers that had betrayed their comrades, uh, traitors would be uh, put into a bag with venomous snakes, and then that bag would be closed up and the bag would be thrown into a river and the soldier would either drown or die from uh, snake bites. I should also add that decimation as a punishment was uh, fairly rare, and it becomes more and more rare as, as the, the Roman civilization uh, continues. Um, they don't want to uh, you know, waste troops because, yes, 10% of the rebelling unit are going to be killed, but the other 90% are going to be put in harm's way by being forced to sleep outside of camp. This slide shows an image of Roman citizens on the march over a Roman road. And the other part of this slide shows modern reenactors uh, wearing uh, reproductions of Roman military equipment. The daily life, um, the everyday experience of a Roman uh, soldier, especially a Roman legionary, was very difficult. Uh, soldiers would get up very early, uh, usually before dawn, and then they would break camp 
loading up all of their supplies, their tents, their equipment, uh, building tools, uh, and more. And then they would march uh, about 20 miles per day. Um, and they would complete this march typically in about five hours. And so at midday, they would stop their march and they would begin to build another camp for the night. And these camps were uh, heavily fortified. They were made of wood and of iron nails. Uh, they would have brought some wood with them uh, in wagons, but they probably also would have cut down trees in the area. Roman soldiers often carried saws and other equipment they would need to uh, cut down trees and to build uh, fashioned wooden camps. In fact, if you want to find evidence of temporary Roman camps, you don't just look for things like uh, latrines and earthen walls. You also look for uh, nails in the ground. The Romans brought nails with them that they used to hold um, all of their uh, wood walls and fortifications together. Uh, these nails here are from what is now Scotland, and they were uh, probably used sometime in the early to mid 80s CE. And during these long marches, Roman soldiers, they carried uh, their weapons, uh, their clothing, their, uh, their bedding, and they carried uh, building equipment. And we think the average kit of a Roman soldier could have varied. Uh, it could have been between 50 to 90 pounds, depending on what type of, the, of equipment they'd been issued. And to be a Roman soldier did not just mean fighting uh, on behalf of Rome. Roman soldiers were basically builders or construction workers as well. They built these fortified camps for themselves while they were on campaign. Uh, they also would have done work on roads. Um, they would have maintained roads. They would have built new roads. And these roads would then be used by subsequent Roman armies. And of course, these roads would have been used by Roman uh, civilians as well to travel and to move goods from one area to the other. These roads are a part of the, the Pax Romana, every bit as much as uh, the Roman soldiers uh, who, who travel across them are. And because of the militarism of Roman society, Roman uh, physicians and surgeons get a lot of experience with uh, dealing with wounds. They get a lot of experience with human anatomy and they had a very good understanding of human anatomy, especially male anatomy. Their understanding of female anatomy was not as good. Um, these physicians would have wanted to learn as much as they could about the body and about treating wounds to help uh, prevent uh, wounded soldiers from dying of, of, of their wounds. Perhaps the most famous uh, Roman physician was uh, Claudius Galenus, better known as Galen. He lived sometime between 129 and 216 CE. Galen was actually of Greek and ethnicity, and he built on a lot of previous uh, Greek medical scholarship. The Greeks also studied medicine uh, as well. And Galen added on to Greek knowledge of the four humors and of balancing uh, the body's um, various humors, uh, blood, uh, phlegm, things like that. The Romans believed that that was the key to preventing illness. They were a bit mistaken in that regard, but when it came to anatomical knowledge, they, they knew quite a bit more, I would say. Um, Galen practiced dissection and of, of, of dead bodies. He also practiced vivisection as well. And vivisection is the dissection of, of living things, in this case, generally animals, which not a, a pleasant thing to think about at all, but it's a great way to learn more about anatomy and how organs work. And Galen's discoveries will be passed on to other um, surgeons. Surgeons worked in the military, but also uh, civilian physicians, especially um, vulnerious surgeons, uh, soldiers, surgeons who dealt with wounds. And these, um, so these physicians who specialize in treating wounds often worked with gladiators because gladiators uh, like military uh, personnel often became wounded, much more so than a civilian person would. And I think by the standards of the day, Roman uh, surgical procedures were actually uh, fairly advanced. They could do things like uh, cataract surgery even, which uh, certainly would have been very painful for the patient undergoing such a uh, procedure. The Romans did not have uh, an modern anesthetics they would have probably used things like wine, for example, to intoxicate the patient so they would 
uh, be less responsive to pain. Also, the uh, Romans did not have an antiseptics in the modern sense easier in, 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 as well. So infection would have been more of a concern for uh, uh, patients in ancient Rome. Uh, physicians would have tried to prevent uh, what we would call infection today using like salves and poultices, but they didn't have modern germ theory the way uh, modern uh, physicians do. We think also, very interestingly, that uh, Romans maybe even had uh, cosmetic surgery. We know that uh, the Romans looked down on people who uh, had been circumcised, and we think that some people living in the Roman civilization may have tried to have foreskin reconstruction procedures because they wanted to look like they had not been circumcised because the Romans, like the Greeks, saw circumcision as mutilation, and the Romans, like the Greeks, uh, there would have been many opportunities for people to well, see you naked, uh, especially at the bathhouse or at the gymnasium. And for people to see you circumcised, that would not have been a good thing. So they may have even had things like um, reconstructive or, or plastic surgery. And as I mentioned, uh, Elagabalus, a uh, Roman emperor, even uh, was interested in, in plastic surgery as well. So in many ways, Roman, uh, medical knowledge was very sophisticated for the time. But in other ways, it, um, there were some misconceptions that the Romans had about the human body. Here are some examples of medical instruments that would have been used in uh, the Roman civilization. Uh, the left image is medical instruments from Pompeii uh, between the first century uh, BC and the first century CE. And the Romans had uh, by the Sarahs of the day, very sophisticated medical instruments. They had scalpels, they had saws, uh, bone saws for amputations, they had uh, forceps for extracting uh, arrowheads from wounds, they had uh, devices like a speculum for uh, holding wounds open during medical uh, procedures. They also had uh, spatulas and things that were used for applying salves and poultices to prevent a wound from being infected. Again, the Romans did not have a modern understanding of infection and germ theory. But they did recognize that applying certain substances to wounds could help them heal uh, more quickly and more easily. Now that we've talked about uh, life in the Roman military, um, the experiences of Roman soldiers, Roman medicine, a lot of Roman medical techniques were learned thanks to warfare and uh, combat wounds. We can talk about um, life in the Roman pr provinces, particularly for uh, civilian people, people not involved in the military. So the Roman Empire at its height had something like 50 to 90 million inhabitants, about 20 to 40 percent of the world's population. And those numbers vary quite a bit because Roman censuses were done using different methodologies. Sometimes children were counted, sometimes they were not. Sometimes slaves were counted, sometimes they were not. That's why you get such uh, varying statistics uh, regarding population. Before the year 212 CE, um, roughly 20% of the free adult male population were actually citizens. So for most of Roman history uh, during the imperial period, most of the population are not citizens. They don't enjoy the rights that Roman citizens have. They don't have some of the responsibilities that Roman citizens have. There are certain taxes that citizens paid and certain taxes that non-citizens paid. And there's two kinds of provinces. There's senatorial provinces. These are, uh, the senatorial provinces here are shown in uh, pink. They are ruled either by a official appointed by the Senate, or they are ruled uh, directly by the Senate. I talk about um, how the senatorial provinces were governed in a previous video. And then the uh, imperial provinces are ruled by an official chosen by the emperor. And I also talk about how the imperial provinces are ruled in a uh, previous video. And most of these freeborn male citizens, uh, they would have lived in Italia, on the Italian peninsula, or they would have been born to um, Italo-Romans, basically people who are ethnically Roman, 
who could trace their ancestry to the Italian peninsula. Um, after the third social war, which I talked about in a previous video, all people were made, all people who were uh, free in the Italian peninsula were made citizens. And over time, more and more uh, people are going to uh, be made citizens. But the big change is going to take place um, in uh, 212 CE because of the Edict of Caracalla, which I mentioned in a previous video. And this, this Edict of Caracalla made all freeborn Romans citizens. And Caracalla did this uh, for taxation purposes. Uh, now everyone would have to pay the taxes that Roman citizens had to pay. And also this would have allowed more uh, Roman men to serve in uh, the legions. Before 212, uh, a non-Roman citizen would have had to serve as an auxiliary, but having um, the Edict of Caracalla opens up more men to serve in the Roman legions. So Caracalla's edict, while it's a good thing because it extends the rights of citizens to more people, it was done for uh, perhaps self-serving reasons, taxation, and then to have a larger military. And of course, uh, Roman women could be citizens, but they did not have the rights of male citizens, particularly when it came to uh, politics. And of course, I would say that citizenship becomes easier across the course of Roman um, history, but the rights that Roman citizens have tend to shrink. Uh, their, the Roman citizen has less control over uh, his leaders, basically. Rome goes from being a republic to being an empire. And the responsibilities of Roman citizens increase. Taxation increases, for example. Now I want to use the uh, Pompeii and Herculaneum sites as basically a case study for what life was like in the senatorial provinces in the Roman Empire, specifically what life was like in Italia, the cultural heartland of the Roman people. And the Pompeii and Herculaneum sites give us unprecedented views into daily life for regular Roman people, what kind of houses they lived in, the kind of food they ate, the kind of um, facilities and infrastructure they had and they made use of, and the nature of how these sites were preserved by the Mount Vesuvius volcanoes. Um, it gives us almost like a snapshot in time, frozen in time, uh, the uh, the people of uh, Pompeii and Herculaneum, uh, even their um, many of their uh, bodies are preserved by the um, the ash of uh, the Mount Vesuvius volcano. In our discussion, I'll bring in some artifacts from some other sites as well that we'll use kind of in a comparative perspective, comparing um, finds from Pompeii and Herculaneum with finds made in other parts of the senatorial provinces. To begin, I'll say that Pompeii was a fairly small town in central Italy. Um, certainly it's a small town by our modern standards, but it's a decent sized uh, town or even a city by Roman standards and by the standards uh, used by archeologists and scholars. Um, scholars like uh, V. Gordon Child, um, who is very well known they argue that um, a city by ancient world standards, it has to have a decent sized population. It has to have divisions of labor. It has to have um, social stratification. It has to have monumental architecture and art and an economy. And Pompeii has all of those things. So it might seem kind of like a small town to us today, but it's definitely a city by ancient Roman standards. I mean, it's, it's not as big as Rome, of course, but uh, 10,000 to 20,000 inhabitants is the estimate. And we think uh, about 2,000 people uh, were killed uh, during the Mount Vesuvius eruption. I wouldn't be surprised though if that number of 2,000 uh, increases over time because as of now, only about two thirds of Pompeii have been excavated. As more parts of uh, Pompeii are excavated, they will find uh, more human remains and that number will, will certainly increase. Um, but Pompeii and Herculaneum and some of the surrounding uh, villages, 
they were uh, destroyed by the Mount Vesuvius eruption that occurred sometime near the summer or fall of 79 CE. And these settlements are rapidly uh, covered over by um, ash, by um, falling stones from Mount Vesuvius. Um, while most of the residents of, of Pompeii would have escaped, a large number were trapped in the city and their bodies were uh, covered over and uh, not mummified, but um, certainly their skeletal remains have been preserved in a way that archaeologists can study them. So in many ways, it's almost like these sites were frozen in time. This is different than other cities that were continuously occupied like Rome, where um, Roman era buildings in Rome were uh, leveled or modified during the medieval era or during the uh, Renaissance or early modern era. So uh, the Pompeii and Herculaneum sites, they give archaeologists, as I said, an unprecedented ability to view uh, everyday Roman life. And these uh, sites, they were rediscovered in about the late 1500s, but major excavations did not really begin until the 1700s. Um, ash and uh, pyroclastic flow, what might be called a type of hot lava, um, comes out of Mount Vesuvius, um, covers over the buildings, um, it kills what residents were still alive that managed to survive the toxic gases and um, stones that were being shot out of the volcano. But this um, ash and these flows, they cover over um, these settlements, preventing um, future settlement and, and demolition of these buildings. The ash does some damage to the buildings. The buildings at Pompeii don't have um, their roofs. Their roofs were caved in, but other parts of the buildings are very well preserved, being covered over, preventing, um, preventing their uh, decomposition or their demolition. And the Pompeii uh, site and the Herculaneum site, they're some of the richest archaeological sites of the Roman civilization, and really some of the richest archaeological sites ever found of any civilization. Uh, we've learned so much about Roman life by studying them. And the images on these slides are 3D reconstructions of what uh, Pompeii would have looked like before the uh, Vesuvius blast. Um, remember, um, if you go to Pompeii today, many of the buildings don't have roofs because uh, the roofs were knocked off by the ash that was falling. If you're seeing a building with a roof in Pompeii, its roof has been restored, generally speaking. Herculaneum, uh, the buildings are a little bit better preserved. They do have their upper floors. This is because of the type of ash that was falling in Herculaneum was, was different than the kind that was falling in Pompeii. So we'll talk about the infrastructure of Pompeii. And this city, like other Roman cities, big cities like Rome, and then of course a smaller city um, like Pompeii, has very infra intricate infrastructure. It roads, sidewalks, sewers, etc. These were built to make traversing the city easier, um, to deal with runoff and waste, and Pompeii has these things. Um, there's different types of buildings in Pompeii. Wealthy patrician and senatorial class type people would have lived in very nice private houses and villas. They would have had uh, marble fixtures, mosaics, fresco paintings. They would have had private fountains and private toilets. Uh, very, very uh, different ways of living. There's a lot of social stratification that can be observed at these sites. And poorer people would have lived in apartment buildings uh, where they would have had their own apartments. These were called insulae or like islands. Uh, and the insulae would have come in varying levels of quality based on what that everyday Roman could afford. Some insulae were nicer than others. And as I mentioned before, wealthier Romans, they would have had private toilets and fountains, whereas uh, poorer Romans, plebeians, and just everyday Romans who didn't have a lot of money, they would have uh, not had access to these kind of facilities, at least not in their own homes. They would have had to use a public toilet uh, outside of their home. They would have had to use a public fountain um, that provided water to poorer people. And 
wealthier Romans, they would have had their own private kitchens where they would have had um, people cooking for them, presumably slaves. Um, poorer Romans, they would have uh, gone to what were basically food stands uh, outside of their insulae, uh, where they would have eaten a variety of food of lower quality than that of the uh, upper class Romans. And people of all classes in uh, Pompeii would have gone to bathhouses, uh, and they just nice wealthier Romans would have gone to nicer bathhouses, and then poorer Romans would have gone to cheaper bathhouses. And we think that Romans like to go to the bathhouse every day. They would go to uh, bathe and to engage in other activities as well. But we'll talk about bathhouses more uh, later in this uh, video. And the ash uh, sealed out a lot of the, the air that uh, causes decomposition, that causes oxidation. So a lot of um, the artwork and buildings are pretty well preserved. And of course, the ash and pyroclastic flows, they forced the people of Pompeii to abandon th these sites. They did not continue to live here uh, generation after generation. They were abandoned. So we can really get a snapshot, a, a slice of life of what uh, life was like in Italia about the year 79 uh, BCE. C. This is a uh, villa in the city of Pompeii. You can see it has a very nice uh, courtyard. Uh, the villas of, of wealthy Romans had courtyards where they could spend time outdoors, enjoying nature. Um, as I mentioned before, the upper levels, upper floors, usually were destroyed in Pompeii. So this would have been a re this is a reconstruction that's been done by archaeologists of what. Um, the upper level of this villa would have looked like. Some villas had multiple stories, others did not, and they have been able to um, restore a lot of these buildings so we can get an idea of what they might have looked like when they were actually being lived in by Romans before the eruption. So we can learn a lot about Roman architecture from uh, the buildings at Pompeii. You also see uh, the tiles on the roof, you can see uh, the stone that's being used, brick that's being used as well. And these columns are of uh, the Tuscan order. They lack the fluting on the shaft that you would see in the Doric order. So uh, you can get a good idea of what um, the architecture of a private home would have looked like. A private home, of course, for a wealthy Roman. Wealthy Romans would have had their own bedrooms, dining rooms, atriums, offices within these uh, villas, but slaves also would have lived in these uh, villas as well to serve the families that owned them. And this room we think is, uh, or was, uh, quarters for slaves in a Roman uh, villa. We can see amphorae or jars and other uh, equipment and tools and things. Uh, and then there's also the beds that uh, the slaves would have used. And these rooms are preserved uh, by the ash. There's also uh, been some concrete that's been used uh, to fill in impressions left behind by items that did not survive the ash that were uh, carbonized. So we can get an idea of what the furniture would have looked like, what these beds would have looked like. You can see uh, patterns from some kind of textile on the top of the bed, on the surface of the bed. You can also, of course, see amphorae, jars, and other types of pottery. We think that slave quarters were not just uh, places where slaves slept. They were probably also used as storage rooms, as multi-use spaces, kind of like supply closets in modern buildings. Um, the Romans viewed slaves as property, and so they kept their slaves' quarters with their other property of like jars, for example. So the interior of these villas also show signs of social stratifications between the slave owners and the enslaved. Wealthy Romans would have had their own facilities and their own plumbing in their in their villas, but poorer Romans would not necessarily have had those things in their insulae. In fact, poorer Romans would have had to have used public fountains and public toilets. Uh, this is a example of a public toilet in uh, Pompeii. It would have been used possibly by multiple people at a time. Uh, there would have been running water to uh, flush out the waste in this toilet. 
The Romans also kept uh, sponges and things that they used to clean themselves. And generally speaking, these toilets, especially these public toilets, were not very clean. They were very dirty. They would have had uh, graffiti. They would have had uh, posters and paintings on the wall. And certainly they would have been uh, dirty because they're, they're toilets. To make matters worse, uh, it appears that not every toilet actually had uh, water and was attached to the sewage system in Pompeii. In fact, many of these toilets appear to have really been more just like outhouses. They were not attached to uh, a sewage system, a sewer system, the way, they were, the way they were supposed to be. So those toilets that were not hooked to the sewers would be even worse than the ones that were. These are fountains at Pompeii. The left is a public fountain, and these fountains would have had a uh, continuous flow of water via uh, pi pipes and aqueducts. And the Romans, um, they built their pipes out of lead, typically, which, of course, will lead to problems. It's, uh, lead is toxic to uh, people and living things. On the right, we can see a uh, fountain in a private home that's decorated with uh, mosaics and you know, is there not just to be functional, but to be aesthetically pleasing as well. So with these fountains, we also see evidence of social stratification in uh, Pompeii. This diagram illustrates how the aqueduct system uh, would have worked in the ancient Roman civilization. The Greeks also built aqueducts, but they were not as sophisticated and as extensive as those built by the Romans. The Romans would build um, these networks of arches, uh, these aqueducts, to carry water from springs, usually in mountains of some kind. Then the um, water would be moved into a reservoir, which would store the water and provide pressure. That way the water could then be sent through pipes, in many cases lead pipes, and it could um, fill up fountains, it could fill up uh, pools and bathhouses, they could even uh, be sent to uh, latrines as well, or to toilets. Although, as I mentioned at Pompeii, some of the toilets were not connected uh, properly. And then um, the wastewater coming from these places would be dumped into uh, rivers, where it would then eventually uh, flow into the ocean. So uh, the wastewater from Roman cities could... Um, and would pollute uh, natural bodies of water. On the positive side, this allows Roman city cities to be uh, cleaner, and this means that cities in Rome can have a, in the Roman civilization, can have a larger population. Disease is not going to be as big of a factor um, in these in these cities. Disease still exists in in Roman cities, as we've mentioned before, but it's not going to be as as big of a problem because of uh, these sanitation. Uh, networks, these water uh, networks that are being used that bring clean water into the cities. On the negative side, of course, um, uh, this wastewater is dumped into uh, natural bodies of water, which is not good if you're downriver. And as I mentioned before, uh, these pipes, many of these pipes are made of lead, which is uh, not good for people. And some of the uh, infrastructure is not properly connected to uh, the uh, water uh, network. These are images of the aqueduct and the reservoir that would have served Pompeii. Wealthier Romans had pipes built to their houses. Uh, poorer Romans would have used public facilities. Um, the city of Pompeii and Herculaneum, they get their water from the Apennine Mountains, from springs in the mountains. Uh, the water travels down the aqueducts into the reservoir and into the city, and then into the sewers, and then it makes its way out into the ocean. In this case, the Mediterranean Sea. The Romans could also build underwater aqueducts and reservoirs. This is an example from Naples. It's the uh, most expensive aqueduct system ever built by the Romans because it's underground. And digging an underground aqueduct is going to be much more difficult and much more dangerous than building an above ground uh, arch based aqueduct. This is a diagram of uh, Pompeii with one scholar's proposal for what the water distribution system would have looked like, basically that there are a network of um, pipes that bring water from the aqueducts into the city, and those pipes are going to be hooked up to um, 
fountains, water fountains for use uh, for everyday Romans. Uh, those pipes are also going to bring water to buildings like bathhouses. Um, wealthier Romans also could pay to have pipes put into their, uh, their, their homes, their villas. Um, this was very expensive and the average poor Roman did not have uh, running water in his insulae apartment. Um, instead, he would have had to have gone to a public fountain to get the water that uh, he or she needed. Now that we've discussed how the Romans got water to their cities, including cities like Pompeii, we'll talk about uh, the Roman bathhouses, or uh, thermi as they were known. And the Romans put a strong emphasis on personal hygiene. They liked going to these bathhouses. They liked bathing and getting clean. And they attended these bathhouses regularly, uh, probably every day. And bathhouses were attended by Romans of all classes, both rich Romans and poor Romans. Wealthier Romans might have gone to nicer bathhouses and poorer Romans might have gone to cheaper, uh, less expensive bathhouses. This is because the bathhouse in uh, ancient Rome was more than just a place to bathe. Uh, bathhouses had uh, other uh, amenities, steam rooms, saunas, they had hot and cold pools, and many also had attached athletic fields like gymnasiums. Uh, some had libraries where you could read books, and others even had restaurants and places to get food after you would uh, bathe and use the other uh, facilities. The bathhouses also um, had employees. Um, and guests could pay employees for services like massages, haircuts, uh, hair plucking. Romans would uh, pluck out their hair, uh, their body hair as a way of uh, removing it, and you would pay um, uh, someone to do that for you. Uh, and uh, male guests uh, could have uh, sexual services that would be provi provided by uh, sex workers at these bathhouses. The baths were generally segregated by gender. Uh, this would not have included uh, the employees, of course. If a uh, male Roman bathhouse customer wanted to pay uh, a female sex worker, that would not be an issue. But um, male and female bathhouse guests would uh, be separated from each other. And at these bathhouses, people uh, bathed, they swam, but they also uh, played sports in the gymnasium areas. They socialized with their friends and neighbors. They may have debated, debated politics. Uh, they may have read books. And of course, they uh, experienced a variety of other services as well. So in many ways, the Roman bathhouse um, is very similar to the Greek gymnasium in the sense that it's not just a place to go get clean. And by the way, the Greeks built bathhouses as well, but their bathhouses were much smaller and simpler. The uh, Roman bathhouse offered a lot more amenities and services. And some bathhouses were fed by natural hot springs. We looked at an example of a uh, Roman bathhouse that was fed by a hot spring in North Africa. I'll show another example of a hot spring uh, bathhouse later in this video, but other bathhouses instead had to heat their own water. And they would have used um, basically uh, wood-fired heaters and boilers to heat the water. They also would have used uh, what is called a hypocost. And this basically um, is a system that would have heated the floors for uh, the steam rooms and the hot saunas. And you'll also remember that the Minoans built a version of the hypocost as well. Um, this is going back thousands of years before the Roman civilization. But the Romans had a more sophisticated version of the hypocaust. Here is a plan of a generic uh, Roman bath. Uh, this, this one uh, contains a exercise gymnasium area. The Romans exercised naked like the Greeks. They would rub themselves with oil and then scrape this oil off after they had exercised. You can see that this one is a larger bathhouse, which so has uh, separated uh, women's and men's spaces. And you can see the various other uh, amenities it offers. Um, warm rooms, hot rooms, uh, saunas, uh, various pools for swimming and bathing. As I said, these bathhouses were not just about getting clean, they were about uh, socializing, having a good time 
having certain services as well. They were parts of uh, the communities that they were built in. This is the interior of the bathhouse at Pompeii. You can see uh, the Roman uh, domes and arches that the site contains. This is an example of a Roman spring-fed bath. This one is in uh, Bath, England. It was built uh, sometime between 60 and 70 CE. And it's uh, spring-fed, the water is naturally warm. Uh, it's not um, very hot though. In fact, you can't swim in the, these baths uh, in Bath, England because there are um, parasitic microorganisms, specifically brain-eating amoebas in, in the water. Uh, if you want to swim in uh, this spring, you have to go to another uh, location where they've dug uh, modern uh, swimming holes for this uh, hot spring. But it's really more of a warm spring than a hot spring. This is the Baths of Caracalla. These are built in Rome. It's much larger than the bathhouse you would uh, see in a smaller city. It's built for the people of Rome. Rome is a much larger city. Uh, at certain points, it had a million or more residents. Uh, this one was built between 211 and 217 CE. And it was built by Emperor Caracalla. It's the, at the time, it was the largest bathhouse in Rome until a larger one was built by Emperor Diocletian. And Caracalla's bathhouse had free entry um, for the people of Rome. It was exquisitely decorated. Um, you can see the uh, zebra stripe uh, mosaics here. You see this zebra stripe pattern in a lot of Roman buildings. We think uh, it was not just art for art's sake. This zebra stripe pattern may have actually been a signal for the people walking in these areas to walk more quickly because it kind of looks like arrows. This is just the speculation of some archaeologists, but I think it's a pretty good hypothesis. That it's more than just a design. And the Baths of Caracalla have inspired other uh, later buildings, including modern buildings like Penn Station. But uh, this bathhouse would fall into disuse in about the 530s uh, CE. 530 is after the Western Roman Empire fell, uh, and Rome's population had fallen significantly, and there just were not enough people in Rome to maintain such a large bathhouse. Now that we've talked about the Roman bathhouse, we'll talk about the Roman insulae, basically Roman apartment buildings. And they varied in quality. Some would have been nicer to live in than others. Basically, they were multi-story buildings that featured apartments that would be rented out by poorer Romans. In the insulae, the nicest apartments were on the lower floors. This was because the lower floors, it was easier to get out of a lower uh, level of the building if there was a fire or if the building began to collapse. Buildings collapsed pretty frequently in Rome, leading uh, Augustus Caesar to actually pass building codes so that buildings would be built according to regulations, they'd be less likely to collapse. Also, if you fall out the window, out of the window of a uh, lower level apartment, you're less likely to be seriously injured or killed. Uh, it appears that people fell out of the windows of these insulae quite frequently. So the upper levels uh, were not as nice. You know, nowadays the upper level is usually more expensive. It's the penthouse, but not in a Roman era insulae. And of course, these buildings typically did not have indoor plumbing in the uh, apartments themselves. So if you need to get down to uh, the toilet, um, you want to be on a lower level. Also, if you want to have a fire, um, it's easier to have a fire if you're in the lower level in case the building catches on fire. You knock over your fire and you start to set the building uh, ablaze. So the lower levels are more desirable for, for Romans. Also, you're closer to the ground. Um, there's no elevators in Roman uh, insulae. You don't want to have to go up as many flights of stairs. You're closer to the amenities on uh, the ground, uh, like the food stands where people bought their food, purchased their food and other services. So on the whole, it's much better to be on the lower levels of uh, the insulae apartments. And our observations about insulae um, can help us better understand life for poor Romans in, in the cities. And there were insulae that were nicer in nicer neighborhoods and there were insulae in uh, poorer neighborhoods slums. Um, these insulae would have been built out of brick 
and covered with uh, plaster. Uh, the plaster could be painted, but a lot of the time the plaster had uh, graffiti, um, advertisements painted on them. Basically, there were nicer buildings and there were not as nice of buildings, just as there were nicer neighborhoods and neighborhoods that were not as nice. Shops and kitchens were on the lower floor, as mentioned before, and then there were apartments on the upper floors and the cheapest apartments were on the top floors. And this was because uh, it's harder to get down to the kitchen, harder to get down to the toilets, harder to get down to the fountain. Um, the stairs, uh, there's no elevators. You don't have to go up as many flights of stairs. It's also, of course, less dangerous to be on lower levels in case of a fire or in case the, the building is uh, collapsing. And there's evidence that there was quite a bit of crime in uh, Roman cities, even organized crime. And this uh, is going to get worse in Roman history as the Roman economy really begins to struggle from the 200s on. This is the Western Insulae or the Insulae Occidentalis. It's in Pompeii. They were built probably about the first century BCE and of course, very rapidly abandoned in 79 CE. And you can see uh, the arches, you can see uh, brick and stonework, you can see the windows that people might have fallen out of, and of course, you can see bits of uh, the plaster as well that would have covered over the brick and stonework. And a lot of that plaster would have been painted and would have had uh, graffiti and all other um, inscriptions and things on it. So now we'll talk about private Roman homes, specifically uh, Roman villas or um, villas could uh, vary in quality as well based on how wealthy uh, the family that owned the villa uh, was. Some villas were very, very large, uh, very expansive. Others were smaller. Generally speaking, um, the villas in, in more urbanized areas like Pompeii are going to be smaller than a villa out in a rural area, especially a, a, a villa that's on a, a landed estate like a latifundio. And the owner of these private homes, these villas, would have wanted to have as nice of a home as he could afford to show off his social status, to show off his wealth. Uh, these wealthy Romans were patrons. They would want to impress their clients when they invited clients over to their homes. A larger home means you can host more clients at once and you can impress the clients with your wealth. Over time, however, though, you'll notice that wealthy Romans, they will spend less time at their urban homes and a lot more time out in the countryside on their larger estates. They're basically withdrawing from their kind of patron client civic op obligations. And there's a lot of reasons for why, why this was. It, it just it's becoming more and more expensive over time for Roman patrons to support their clients. And in response, they basically abandoned many of their client and patron uh, responsibilities. And this is going to be a contributing factor to the fall of the Roman Empire. Roman villas also, um, they do exhibit levels of regional variation in the type of materials that are being used. This Roman villa here is definitely more from the Roman heartland. It has a tile roof, it has brick and plaster uh, walls, but uh, there could be variations in the types of materials used if the villa is being built in, say, Northern Europe, for example. They're going to use local materials. So the Roman villa would have uh, spaces like an atrium where people would enter the villa. It would have a um, Tablinium, which was basically an office where the patron would have private meetings with clients. It had a uh, triclinium. Basically, triclinium, it's a reference to the three couches that would be in this room. And the triclinium was a dining room where um, the Roman uh, family would have its meals, where they would have dinner parties. They would recline on their couches and they would eat nice meals and be uh, served by their slaves. And there were also uh, bedrooms as well. Bedrooms were called uh, cubiculum, kind of like our uh, modern word for cubicle. And the atrium, uh, while it was at the entrance of the home, in many ways was a lot like a living room. People would um, 
meet each other there. It was more of a public meeting place, whereas the uh, the tablinium was more of a uh, private uh, meeting place. This is a uh, modern diagram of a rural villa. It's on a latifundio estate. You can see the basic floor plan of the, the villa itself is not that much different. It has a courtyard in the center, for example, but then it's attached with various outbuildings, uh, barns uh, where livestock are stored. There are um, agricultural fields all around. Um, you can see wheat, you can see orchards and olive groves. You can see uh, vineyards where grapes are grown to make wine. This, this uh, latifundia is, is taking part in Mediterranean polyculture, uh, growing wheat, growing grapes, and growing olives. And then there's also livestock and uh, other agricultural products are going to be produced at these estates. And what you see over time in the Roman civilization is that wealthy Romans are spending less and less time in the cities. Um, helping the urban poor and more and more time at their landed estates out in the countryside. And this breakdown of client patron relationships as the Roman patrons are leaving their urban clients behind, it's going to be a contributing factor to the destruction of uh, the Roman Empire. This is the Villa of Mysteries in Pompeii. It was probably built about the second century BCE and of course, very rapidly abandoned uh, at uh, the year 79 CE. And it's a, it's a beautiful site. It has some very nice frescoes. And we'll take a look at uh, this villa in a bit more detail to give, give you all an idea of some of the features of uh, Roman villas, at least of the villas in Pompeii. Here is some of the restoration work being done on the Villa of Mysteries. Uh, you, the buildings at Pompeii, generally, they don't, they don't have their um, roofs, their second floors. They were destroyed by the uh, falling ash and pumice that came off of the, uh, the Vesuvius uh, eruption. So they've done some restorative work to show uh, visitors what the Villa of Mysteries would have looked like with its roof uh, when it was intact before the 79 uh, eruption. Here is the Villa of Mysteries floor plan featuring um, a atrium and a courtyard and then uh, various rooms uh, that could be used for a variety of activities around the edge. So its structure is uh, very uh, typical of a Roman villa. This is a fresco from the Villa of Mysteries. These frescoes have been extensively restored uh, as archeologists and preservationists uh, are um, restoring these frescoes. Uh, that way visitors can see what they would have looked like um, when the, the Villa of Mysteries was being inhabited before 79 CE. And this site is called the Villa of Mysteries because the scenes in the fresco we think show various mysteries or Roman uh, rituals, cultural and religious rituals that Roman uh, people would have engaged in. We don't know what the actual inhabitants of the Villa of Mysteries would have called uh, their home. These images uh, are close-ups of frescoes from the Villa of Mysteries. Uh, they show what we believe are either women preparing for a, uh, a wedding ceremony. It's some kind of bridal ceremony or rite of passage. It could also be uh, women preparing for a religious ritual as well, some kind of religious initiation ritual in order to join a religious cult in ancient Rome. Uh, you know, a cult was a group of people that served a specific god or goddess. You had to undergo certain rituals and it could be that these women are preparing for a ritual like this or they're preparing for a wedding ceremony, which is also very ritualistic in ancient Rome. So the villas at Pompeii in addition to having frescoes, they also have mosaics. And the Romans, like the Greeks, uh, really liked mosaics and they have some excellent mosaics at their uh, homes. Uh, these were made from uh, small tiles called tesserae, uh, described in a previous video. And they probably learned uh, about mosaics from the Greeks and probably many of the mosaic uh, 
artists or craftsmen who made mosaics may have actually been Greek themselves. That is, ethnic Greeks who lived in the Roman civilization. And I would argue that the Romans took mosaics to a whole uh, different level, um, being that they had you know, use of concrete. Um, they had more of an interest in private art than the Greeks did, generally speaking. Uh, the Greeks, for much of their history, especially during the classical period, they believed that if you were going to have an art project commissioned, you had public art made to show your uh, largesse to the community. For the Romans, they, they liked both private and public art because for the Romans, I would argue because of the patron-client relationship, the, uh, the home was a much more public space and a Roman patron would want to have a very well-decorated home with frescoes and mosaics. That way he could show uh, his wealth uh, and his social status off to his clients and inspire their loyalty. Some mosaics have inscriptions, others do not, requiring a level of interpretation of, of this artwork. But some of the best preserved mosaics that we have are from Pompeii because of the fact that the site was very quickly abandoned and then covered over by ash and, and pyroclastic flows. And this is an atrium uh, mosaic from uh, the, the villa or house of a uh, Roman by the name of uh, Paculus Proculus. Some of the villas and homes we know who lived there, and so that's why we've given them their names based on their residence. Others, like the Villa of Mysteries, we don't know as much about the residence, so we've named them based on the features of the site. This is a beware of uh, dog mosaic. It actually says uh, beware of the dog. It's from the House of the Tragic Poet at Pompeii. And you can see the dog is on a leash, uh, looks rather uh, intimidating. It's perhaps uh, to show that the resident of this villa had a dog of some kind that he, he used to protect uh, his home. This is a mosaic of Alexander the Great at the Battle of Issus, a very famous battle uh, in Alexander the Great's takeover of the Persian Empire. Uh, a lot of Romans were fascinated with Alexander the Great. They looked up to Alexander the Great. Uh, Julius Caesar looked up to Alexander the Great. Emperor Caracalla also looked up to Alexander the Great. So um, it's not surprising that a wealthy Roman would have a mosaic of Alexander the Great in his home. Uh, this mosaic was probably made about the year 100 uh, BCE, but of course it was um, covered over uh, in 79 CE. This mosaic is not from Pompeii and it's from a little bit later, but it's still very interesting and worth studying. This is a mosaic of women uh, participating in an athletic competition. It's from uh, the Villa Romana in Sicily, and it was made in the late third or early fourth centuries uh, CE. It features, um, in this case, women receiving uh, rewards for their performance in the athletic contest. We get an idea of the kind of uh, garb that women would have worn while performing in sports. It appears that in Roman society, they did not uh, um, perform athletics in, in the nude the way men did. It's been called uh, the Bikini Girls uh, mosaic by some because of the uh, clothing that the, uh, the female athletes are wearing, but it shows that uh, women were participating in sports uh, in ancient Rome, although they wore at least some clothing. And um, portrayals of women in uh, art um, give an idea of, of uh, female beauty standards in the ancient Roman civilization. Um, ancient Romans seem to have admired women that had uh, larger, more full hips and uh, smaller breasts. It was said that uh, breasts were to be unobtrusive in uh, Roman beauty standards. They also admired women who uh, participated in sports and had athleticism as well. So this gives an idea of uh, what Roman society thought was beautiful in, in women, what uh, was the ideal uh, female body. With this information in mind about uh, visual art, uh, mosaics, frescoes, uh, ideas about uh, female beauty, we can talk more about clothing and appearance in uh, ancient Rome uh, during the uh, imperial period.
generally uh, male Roman citizens would wear uh, tunics and then they would wear togas as well uh, of varying quality and color based on uh, the amount of wealth uh, that Roman citizen had. Um, white and purple um, white and purple togas would be worn by uh, Roman senators. White uh, fabric was very expensive. It had to be bleached. They actually would use uh, urine to bleach things in ancient Rome. They would also um, cover uh, white cloth in uh, chalk to make it look whiter as well. And senators would wear white and purple, uh, but then emperors would wear uh, purple tunics. And of course, Roman purple is more of a reddish color. It's um, made from Phoenician um, Phoenician dye, which is made from a certain uh, mollusk. And there were laws about toga wearing in ancient Rome. Rome had sumptuary laws, that is laws about clothing. Uh, Non-citizens were not permitted to wear togas. Uh, the toga was meant to be a symbol of Roman citizenship. And the toga probably actually has Etruscan origins, uh, but it was adopted by the Romans and then became a symbol of Roman citizenship. Over time, though, Romans are less interested in wearing togas, it seems. It seems especially by the 300s, togas were only something that was worn on special occasions by Romans. And eventually, some Roman leaders, emperors, will actually make laws saying that if you are a Roman citizen and if you are uh, engaged in business, that you have to wear the toga. So the toga went from being a status symbol to a form of formal wear, and then it got to the point where Actually, very late in the Roman civilization, a few Romans wore togas. And the toga was meant to be Roman men's clothing, but some Roman women wore togas, especially uh, prostitutes and sex workers, to symbolize that they were uh, prostitutes and that they were acting in many ways beyond the bounds of, of uh, what was considered appropriate for female sexuality. In colder parts of the Roman civilization, Romans might wear trousers as well, but generally speaking, trousers were looked down upon for most of Roman history. For women's clothing, uh, women would have worn um, long dresses called stolas, and uh, they also would have worn uh, cloaks called pallas. And as was the case in the Greek civilization, um, Roman women did not leave the home with their head uncovered if they were a uh, proper woman that was adhering to the social norms of their culture. And the clothing in terms of textiles could be made from wool and linen, or very wealthy Romans might wear imported silk. Although uh, it was considered to be inappropriate for men to wear silk, and in some cases there were laws against men wearing silk, it was seen as being too soft and, and being effeminate if a man wore uh, silk. Remember, there's very strict gender norms in Roman society. As, as far as hairstyles go, men generally wore their hair uh, pretty short um, in what might be called the Caesar cut today. Generally, they did not have uh, beards. They were generally clean shaven, although beards will become more popular uh, from the 100s into about the 300s. Uh, Romans after the 100s will copy Emperor Hadrian who, who made the beard a popular style. In Roman society, women typically wore their hair long and they would uh, style it with various types of curls and other hairstyles. They would wear their hair up or they would wear their hair down, depending on what the style of the period was. And we can often date uh, visual art of Roman women and statues of Roman women based on their hairstyles. In many cases, very accurately to within about 10 or so years. Women also uh, may have dyed their hair as well. Uh, it appears that blonde was a very popular uh, color for Roman women, and you would uh, dye your hair using things like urine. And there's reports that they would even use things like uh, bird guano or bird feces, which also would have had ammonia in it, and ammonia nowadays is used for bleaching uh, and dyeing hair. Women occasionally would have worn wigs, especially uh, blonde wigs. The hair would have been cut from uh, captive slaves, especially captive slaves taken from uh, northern Europe where blonde hair was more common. Uh, men also may have worn wigs as well, but that would have been considered inappropriate and a violation of, of Roman gender norms. Uh, on their feet, uh, sandals were worn by both uh, men and women, 
In colder parts of the Roman civilization, closed-toed boots could be worn as well, especially by uh, Roman soldiers. And the image on this slide is a uh, fresco portrait of Terentius Neo from Pompeii. It was probably made in the 20s to 30s uh, CE, so before, well before, a couple of decades before the eruption. Um, you see that the uh, Neo is portrayed with darker skin. This is common in ancient Mediterranean art where men are portrayed with darker skin than uh, women. It would seem that the ancient Romans, uh, they associated lighter skin with female beauty. So they may have made the skin uh, in paintings of their women look lighter. It could also be that Neo just had darker skin. Perhaps he was from um, a more southerly part of the Roman Empire. Perhaps he was from Egypt or from the Middle East or North Africa and had migrated to uh, the Italian peninsula. We know that there was a lot of migration, uh, particularly from the eastern part and the southern parts of the Roman Empire to the Italian peninsula. We also see that um, he does not have a full beard. He has a little bit of a wispy mustache. Perhaps uh, he was struggling to grow a beard, or perhaps they're trying to show his youth. And uh, both he and the woman in the, the fresco, presumably his wife, are portrayed with uh, devices related to writing, a scroll and a tablet and stylus. Perhaps this is done to show that both he and his wife were literate. We think that Neo may have been a baker and that he was fairly well off, certainly well off enough to afford a fresco of, of himself and his family. Before we continue our discussion of Roman clothing and beauty standards and things of that nature, I want to talk a little bit about race and ethnicity in the Roman civilization. Um, the Roman civilization was multi-ethnic from its beginning. As you'll remember from previous videos, the Romans dealt with people like the Celts, the Etruscans, other uh, Italian um, people living on the Italian peninsula from very early in their history, and they absorbed those cultures over time. As the Roman Republic and then the Empire expand, the Roman civilization will become increasingly multi-ethnic. Uh, people from across Europe and North Africa and the Middle East and it will, I would argue, become multiracial as well. Um, there were people of Mediterranean descent, of Northern European descent, and then people of Middle Eastern descent, and even uh, Sub-Saharan African uh, people who were living in uh, the empire as well. Although the Roman Empire did not extend into Sub-Saharan Africa, there's movements of peoples uh, coming up from Sub-Saharan Africa, going to places like Egypt, and uh, we know that people in parts of the empire would relocate to Rome. It's the capital of the Roman civilization. There would have been jobs, economic opportunities in Rome. So Rome itself uh, would have been especially uh, multi-ethnic. And how do we know about the people of uh, different, different races living in, in Rome? Well, we have anthropological studies on human remains in which we find genetically there's people of many different ethnic groups uh, and racial groups living in uh, the Roman uh, territories. And we also have uh, Roman artifacts that show people of different, different races, people of uh, Northern European descent and people of uh, Sub-Saharan African descent and then people of uh, Mediterranean descent, either Mediterranean parts of Europe. And we also have documentary sources that mention um, the different types of people that lived in the Roman civilization. And like the people of today, the Romans certainly were aware of what we call differing racial phenotypes, uh, that people, depending on where, where their uh, ancestry is, uh, where, what their um, genetics are, that they have different uh, appearances. Some people have darker skin, some people have lighter skin. Some people have different bone structure. Some people have different hair texture. The Romans recognized uh, these um, differences in appearance, and they... Uh, depict them in their art. Although these, um, these things would have meant slightly different things to the Romans, we think that the Roman society had a more fluid idea of race. They did not have a uh, modern uh, idea of, of race. Uh, we do know, though, that the Romans, like the Greeks, thought that they, the Romans, were the best, and that people of M Mediterranean descent were... Um, uh, the best. They thought the people that were further away from the Mediterranean were not as good as they were. So 
they thought that Northern European people were inferior to them. And they also thought of uh, people that were away from the Mediterranean, including Sub-Saharan African people were inferior to them. So they definitely thought that they were the best. They thought that people who were ethnically Roman had a long heritage in the Roman civilization were the best. And slavery, as you know, in the Roman civilization was not based uh, around race. Uh, it was much more based around, were you Roman or were you not Roman? Um, people of all races could be slaves in uh, the Roman civilization, regardless of whether you were uh, Northern European, Sub-Saharan African, or Mediterranean. If you were a captive, a non-Roman person, uh, you could be uh, a slave. There's actually evidence, though, that wealthy Roman slave owners may have actually preferred slaves that looked very differently than them. Uh, visual art of uh, slaves, uh, material culture of slaves, like this, uh, this picture here. It shows a sub-Saharan African person wearing uh, a collar and in a submissive position. This is certainly a uh, sub-Saharan African slave being represented in this picture. We think that the Romans liked having slaves that looked uh, very different than uh, Mediterranean Roman people, but they owned slaves of a variety of ethnicities. It was not just African people uh, being held as slaves in the Roman civilization. So this leads to uh, the question of, was there racism in ancient Rome? The word for racism is not in use until the uh, 1800s and 1900s, but there are things that we might consider to be racist today that were done by the Romans. The Romans thought that uh, people who were not from the Mediterranean were inferior to themselves, for example. And there are um, instances of uh, individual acts of, of racism as well. For example, Roman Emperor uh, Septimus Severus, shown here. Septimus Severus uh, actually was from North Africa, and he was from uh, Roman and Punic ancestry. Uh, this this uh, portrait of Septimus Severus actually shows him with darker skin than his his wife, who was of, of Syrian ancestry. So he had uh, what you might say possibly mixed race ancestry. But uh, Septimus Severus was on um, up in uh, Britannia. He was preparing for a campaign against the Caledonians, and he saw a Ethiopian soldier amongst the troops. This is before the Edict of Caracalla, uh, when only uh, Roman citizens could be in the legions. So this man may have been an auxiliary, or perhaps he came about his citizenship from some other way. The, the document is not very clear on what type of uh, service this African or Ethiopian soldier was engaging in, but it's said that um, Septimus Severus saw this Ethiopian soldier and did not like his color, found his color to be ominous and saw it as a, uh, a bad omen that his campaign was not going to go well. And in the end, Septimus Severus uh, dies shortly thereafter and is not able to uh, go on his campaign. But we would say this was a, uh, a racist idea by Emperor Septimus Severus. Even though he was born in North Africa, he saw a sub-Saharan African with his uh, darker skin as being ominous, as being a bad omen. But of course, this is judging a Roman emperor and his conduct and his ideas by modern standards. As I said, the Romans had a more fluid idea of race on the whole than, than um, modern societies do. And in the present, people debate uh, what kind of actors, for example, should be cast to play Roman historical characters. And there's been some very lively debates over the years about how uh, Roman characters have been, have been cast in, in films and in uh, television shows, cartoons, etc. Who should be playing Romans on screen? And I think that question is best answered by studying uh, the region of the Roman civilization that you're trying to portray, and then studying um, what time period you're portraying. Are you, are you portraying the early Roman Republic, or are you portraying the uh, Roman Empire? And by doing that, and then of course studying the actual individuals, if you're studying um, specific individuals like a Roman emperor, researching what the Romans said this person looked like, where they were from, and by doing that you'll be able to more accurately recreate um, what the Roman society would have looked like. And of course, 
it is a, a multi-ethnic uh, society and in many cases a multi-racial society as well. And continuing on uh, in our study of, of race and ethnicity in Roman society, before we get back to our discussion of uh, uh, clothing and uh, appearance in uh, the Roman civilization, I just want to mention that the time period you're studying within the Roman civilization, uh, within its history, is also very important. If you are, say, trying to make a movie or a TV show about uh, Romans, the demographics of parts of the Roman civilization change with time as a result of migrations of people. Uh, this um, this was from a academic paper done on the genetics of people in Rome uh, over time. They they took samples from uh, before the Roman civilization. And they took samples from the uh, basically the Iron Age uh, Rome and the uh, Republic, so the monarchical period through the uh, Republic, which lasts till 27 BCE. They also did studies uh, during kind of Imperial Rome and then late antiquity as well. And what they found was that um, during the Iron Age and the Republic, a lot more European, uh, that is Northern European DNA can be seen in the, in the remains they study. People of Northern European descent, which makes sense because there were Indo-European migrations uh, from Northern Europe down into the Italian peninsula. We know that the Indo in, that there's a strong Indo-European uh, influence in Roman culture. As Rome expands and becomes an empire, you see that uh, the demographics of Rome shift considerably. You see a lot more people of uh, Mediterranean descent or people from other parts of the Mediterranean, be it uh, Greece uh, or even uh, North Africa or Hispania. And then uh, you also see a lot more Near Eastern ancestry as well, people from Egypt, for example, settling in Rome. So Rome becomes quite a bit more um, uh, ethnically and racially diverse, divided between different groups. In earlier periods, it's mostly just people of, of Northern European descent with uh, some other very small percentages of other groups, whereas it's multiple groups divided a bit more evenly um, as time goes on. But then by late antiquity, you'll see that um, the percentages change a little bit. You'll see the percentage of Northern Europeans goes back up again. This is most likely due to the fact that the Roman civilization is seeing migrations and invasions of Germanic peoples uh, as its civilization is coming to an end. So the demographics change a little bit. So really, if you're studying the Roman civilization to, to say make a movie or a TV show, you should really consider what part of the uh, empire you're looking at and then uh, what uh, time period you're trying to portray as well, because you're going to want to cast very different actors depending on if you're making a movie about a Roman its founding versus Rome at the time of Augustus Caesar. Now we'll return to our discussion of uh, Roman clothing and appearance and beauty standards. As I mentioned before, the toga is considered to be male formal wear. It's identified with Roman citizenship and Roman culture. Over time, Romans will wear uh, tunics less frequently because they're actually kind of uncomfortable to wear. Um, they're difficult to uh, put on. Uh, they do have some utility. Um, they can be used as a hood as well, but you'll see that over time, more and more Romans will just wear tunics, even Roman citizens. And that bothers a lot of more socially conservative Romans who want Romans to wear uh, togas to show their Roman citizenship. And of course, the toga is generally worn by men. The only women that would have worn togas would have been sex workers who were trying to sim symbolize uh, that they were kind of outside of uh, the bounds of Roman gender norms. And Roman women wore uh, stola uh, dresses, which were longer than tunics, and they wore uh, pala cloaks. And of course, they would have uh, covered their heads out in public if they wanted to be seen as a respect respectable woman. Roman society is very patriarchal. It has uh, um, clear gender norms when it comes to clothing. Here are some examples of Roman footwear. These were uh, from Britannia, about the first and second centuries CE. You see uh, sandals, open-toed sandals, but you also see uh, sort of a closed toe sandal boot hybrid. It would have been warmer than just a pair of sandals. Uh, we think that the Romans also may have worn socks as well in uh, colder parts of uh, the empire. 
So they're adapting their footwear, they're adapting some of their clothing based on the environment that they're, they're living in. But there's still certain norms about Roman uh, fashion. The Romans still look down on, on uh, trousers, for example, but they might wear them when it's really cold because it's just more practical. And you'll see that trousers actually become a lot more fashionable amongst the Romans over time, even as other uh, types of clothing like togas become less commonly worn. This is a modern reconstruction of Roman uh, boots. And these boots would have been worn in the colder parts of the, uh, the empire, especially by uh, soldiers. They feature um, hobnails, uh, which are a lot like uh, modern day cleats that would have given these shoes better traction in mud and in snow and, 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 and on the battlefield. And they're gonna be a lot warmer and, and certainly more practical in a colder part of the, uh, the empire than the uh, sandals, the military sandals worn in uh, warmer parts of the empire. Here are some examples of Roman clothing as revealed by Roman sculpture. This is a sculpture of a woman from Herculaneum. This would have been an upper class woman who could afford to have a statue of herself made. It was made between the years 40 and 60 CE based on the style of clothing she's wearing. And this is in the 40s to 60s CE. This is coming off of the Augustan period. Augustus Caesar is, is not the emperor anymore. He has long since passed away, but in the 20 or 30 or so years, fashion is more uh, muted, more understated. Augustus Caesar did not like ostentatious fashion for both men or women. And so people will copy a more minimalist, plainer uh, style of clothing, simpler hairstyles, uh, simpler than what you would have seen during the last days of the Roman Republic in which a lot of uh, Roman women actually copied uh, Cleopatra who was uh, very, very stylish, very fashionable. The next uh, uh, piece is of a uh, teenage, possibly unmarried Roman, young Roman woman, and she has a, a more um, ostentatious hairstyle. This piece is uh, probably from about the 200s uh, CE based on the hairstyle and the clothing. Remember, we use hairstyles and clothing to date um, uh, Roman artifacts. It's, it's easier generally with women's uh, artifacts portraying women than it is with men because women's styles uh, change more frequently and therefore it can be more precise to date um, things with women's uh, fashion. Men's fashion changes less, so it's a little bit more imprecise. This is uh, Emperor Nerva, um, who was emperor from um, 96 to 98 CE. You can see the style of toga he's wearing, uh, the hairstyle he has. He is clean shaven, does not have a beard. But then this is a figure of uh, Marcus Aurelius, uh, who has a beard and has a little bit longer of hair than uh, previous Roman emperors. And Marcus Aurelius had a beard and longer hair to symbolize that he was a philosopher. You know, He had his long beard that he could stroke while he was uh, thinking about Stoic philosophy, for example. And this is from, this piece is from, uh, 161 to 180 CE. So Roman uh, fashion and Roman beliefs about hairstyles will change with time. Generally speaking, men will not have very long hair. Uh, at least free adult men will not have uh, long hair. They'll have uh, shorter hair, uh, usually cut into what we might call the Caesar cut today, where the hair is generally the same length across, uh, across the scalp. And this makes sense because of the shears the Romans had that they would have used to cut hair are fairly primitive. This is a, um, a pair of uh, bronze Roman shears. They were from the second century CE. And they're actually found in Anatolia, but the, they're made in the, this, this pair is made in the Egyptianizing style. So they're not from uh, ancient Egypt, but they have Egyptian decorations. It seems that the Romans really liked many elements of Egyptian culture. They thought it was very exotic. And so these shears are decorated with uh, kind of Egyptian uh, visual art. And this is a uh, Roman razor made of iron. Uh, there are periods in Roman history where the clean shaven style is very popular. Um, basically, Romans uh, usually shaved their beards. Roman men shaved their beards from about the time of the uh, Punic Wars until about the time of Emperor Hadrian, who made beards the style again. Uh, 
Hadrian liked Greek culture and Greek philosophy, and the Greek philosophers had beards, so he grew a beard, and then other emperors like Marcus Aurelius uh, grew beards. And beards are going to be the style until about the 300s. Although with a razor like this, uh, you'd think that more Romans would want to grow beards because who would want to shave or, or be shaved using a, a large razor like this? It seems like uh, it'd be very easy to cut yourself or to have uh, your barber uh, make a mistake and accidentally cut you. Um, to get around this, uh, some Romans may have, instead of shaving, they may have uh, had their hairs plucked out, which would certainly be very painful, but you'd be less likely to cut yourself. And they would have used uh, tweezers for something like that. It was said that uh, Romans would often have their hair plucked out at bathhouses, and there were special, um, specially trained people called hair pluckers that would uh, go around making sort of strange kind of crying out noises, noises to kind of imitate the noise you'd make when you're having uh, your, your hair plucked out. So Romans would have had uh, their body hair plucked out by these hair pluckers. Uh, they, um, this was done by both men and women. Uh, they would have uh, plucked out um, their body hair, although styles do change with time. And the evidence uh, would suggest that it was more important for women to remove their body hair than it was for men to have that done. Here are some other uh, Roman uh, personal uh, care items. This is a uh, comb. Uh, these combs would have been used to keep the hair neat, but also to uh, set up elaborate hairstyles, especially for Roman women. This example is from uh, Britannia from the 140s to 180s CE is when it was probably from. These are a pair of uh, tweezers or forceps. Uh, these are from the first century um, CE. And they could have been used uh, for medical purposes or they could have been used to pluck out uh, hairs. And this is a cosmetic bottle from about the year 100 CE from the uh, Israel-Palestine region. And in Roman culture, um, women generally wore cosmetics. It was considered part of female beauty standards. Uh, they wore all kinds of uh, cosmetics. They wore things uh, to lighten their skin. They wore things to accentuate their eyes, as did other, other uh, cultures like the Greeks before them. Um, men uh, did not wear uh, makeup uh, unless they, if they were trying to follow male beauty standards. Um, sometimes male slaves would uh, be forced to war wear makeup to symbolize that they were slaves, to symbolize they were uh, submissive to make them look more effeminate, but Roman men, uh, free Roman males, did not want to look uh, effeminate. They would not have wanted to wear makeup. And in fact, you might include, you might um, accuse your enemy, your male enemy, of wearing makeup, of being too effeminate. And this doesn't mean that, um, of course, that you were not uh, having sexual relations with, with other men. It was about how you had those relations. So Roman uh, beauty standards for both men and women fit with their gender norms and their views about the relationships between men and women. So now that we've talked about uh, Roman uh, gender norms, uh, Roman uh, appearance, uh, some of uh, the races and ethnic groups that lived in the Roman civilization, and we've talked about some of the clothing uh, and items that they would have used, we can also talk about uh, the food that they would have this is part of their daily lives. And the Romans ate a uh, varied diet, uh, depending on the class that they uh, were a part of. Uh, poorer Romans, their diet was generally less varied. It would have consisted of a lot of uh, wheat, a lot of grains, and um, it would have been made up of, of bread, but also uh, sort of a thin porridge or gruel. Uh, the idea was this, this um, wheat was not good enough to be made into bread, so it would be made into sort of a gruel instead. And uh, they also would have had olive oil, and they also would have had very cheap wine. So the uh, poor Romans definitely ate what was called the Mediterranean Trinity or Mediterranean polyculture. That is uh, grains like wheat, olive oil, and uh, wine of, of generally a lower quality. Wealthier Romans would have had a uh, better diet, a more varied diet. They could have eaten a lot more meat in their diet. They could have had spices imported from Asia. We know that the Romans had contact with, with Asia. They could have had spices brought in. Um, they would have used seasonings like garum. Garum is a 
fish sauce, a fermented fish sauce. It's a lot like modern day uh, Worcestershire sauce. Uh, they also would have seasoned their food with vinegar and honey to make kind of a sweet and sour sauce. And they also would have had more fruits and vegetables. And they would have drank a lot, uh, a lot better wine, wine of a better quality than that of uh, poorer Romans. And the image on uh, this slide is uh, scored bread or panem, uh, which is the Latin word for bread. This was found at Pompeii and it was carbonized by the heat of uh, the Vesuvius eruption. And it features scoring. This would have been uh, marked into the dough. Uh, that way the bread after it was baked could be easily uh, divided into equal pieces. Um, it also would have featured inscriptions saying uh, who made the bread, the day it was baked. That way you would know that you were not buying stale bread. So this is an example of perhaps a meal that would have been consumed by a poorer Roman. As far as uh, meals go, um, poorer Romans especially typically only ate one full meal. They would eat one large meal and some smaller uh, meals. For breakfast, they would have what was called the yenticulum. Uh, this would have been bread uh, or maybe some gruel. The bread might be soaked with uh, wine and perhaps some fruit as well. Remember, poor Romans, they're not eating as nice of food as upper class Romans. For um, uh, Chena or uh, the lunch and dinner, more bread would have been eaten, perhaps some vegetables and maybe some meat or fish if the Roman person could afford it. It just depended on how much money they had, how much they were willing to spend on, on this meal if they had uh, meat. And then uh, in the evening was the Vesperna or supper. And this was a small late night meal, often leftovers from uh, the Chena. And at these meals, the quantity and quality of the food would have varied based on uh, how wealthy the Roman was. A wealthier Roman could have nicer, better bread, better wine, uh, more meat or meat more frequently, uh, more vegetables and fruit. For beverages, Wine would have been the most popular alcoholic beverage. It could be mixed with uh, water and with fruit, almost to make like a punch. And um, they also would have drank uh, beer or cerveza, uh, which would have been popular in grain growing regions. Places like Egypt, for example, uh, beer would have been uh, very popular. They also may have drank mead as well, which is a, uh, a fermented beverage made of honey. And mead was probably popular more in the northern parts of, of the Roman Empire. But by far, wine would have been the beverage of choice for Romans of all classes. It's just richer Romans drank better wine and poorer Romans drank cheaper wine. And upper class Romans would have eat, eaten their food reclining in their triclinium, their uh, dining room. They would have been attended to by slaves who would have uh, brought them food. They would have had entertainment, uh, music, dancing. They um, would have had um, perhaps even uh, sex workers at these, uh, at these dinners to entertain the guests. And at the, um, these feasts, um, both women and men would have attended, uh, unlike the Greeks where only men were guests at feasts. The only women that came to feasts or symposia in um, uh, ancient Greece would have been the women that were slaves and serving the men or women who were involved in the entertainment. And uh, as far as food goes, there's evidence that wealthier Romans, including some Roman emperors, suffered from obesity. They had enough money to eat as much as they wanted, and they uh, became uh, they gained a lot of weight because of that, whereas poorer Romans would not have had that opportunity. Uh, when looking at the human remains left behind by Romans, we observe that they generally have pretty good teeth due to the lack of sugars in their diet. They ate things like honey, but uh, not enough to really uh, rot their teeth or destroy their teeth. Um, the way you might see in other civilizations. Here are some frescoes showing uh, scenes from Roman uh, dinner parties. These are from Herculaneum and Pompeii. As you can see, both men and women are guests at these events. It's not just uh, a men's only event the way it was uh, in Greece. Uh, this, um, this one here shows a, uh, a male attendee drinking out of a drinking horn of some kind. Perhaps he's drinking mead out of a drinking horn. Mead, mead was generally drank out of um, horns in the, the ancient world. Uh, he's not drinking out of a uh, kind of classic um, Roman kylix, 
Greco-Roman style Kylix, a uh, wine glass. Maybe he's drinking meat instead. And they're being attended to by uh, either a servant or a slave. This, um, this fresco here shows uh, young male, uh, presumably slaves, fetching food and drinks for the guests. It looks like they're throwing bones and scraps of food on the ground that are being uh, picked up by uh, animals. This looks like a cat here. So it shows just the decadence of, of the epilum feasts for wealthy Romans who could afford to eat a lot of food and then they could afford to be attended by uh, servants and slaves. Poorer Romans would not have been able to eat nearly as much in their meals. This is a Roman food stand found at Pompeii. It features uh, frescoes here showing, showing uh, ducks and a uh, chicken. And there's also a beware of dog uh, fresco. I think this is a beware of dog fresco because of the leash. It's a very kind of intimidating, very scary looking dog. I don't think they're eating dogs at this restaurant. It could also possibly be a mascot of the restaurant as well, in addition to being a beware of dog sign. Um, the, uh, these circular holes here, they probably would have held pots of food and then um, they would have been heated. That way the food could be kept warm, almost like a, a buffet of some kind. We also see what looks like a, an oven of some sort where bread could have, be, could have been baked. So we can get a good idea of how food was being prepared for working class Romans who didn't have uh, private kitchens in their insula. They would instead go to food stands that were um, built out uh, below uh, their apartment rooms. You can also find animal bones and other um, biomass at these sites, which also gives an idea of what uh, these stands would have served as well in terms of food. This is another uh, Roman food stand, also decorated with frescoes. This one shows uh, some fish. Perhaps fish would have been served at this food stand. Uh, they've also found duck bones and snail shells around this site. So perhaps they're serving duck and perhaps Roman escargot. We know that the Romans like to eat snails. They also like to eat oysters and other, other mollusks as well. These are amphorae jars that may have held wine, so perhaps wine was being sold at this, at this food stand. So these food stands give us a good idea of how everyday Romans prepared their food and, and then the kind of foods they ate as well. And remember, the diet of everyday Romans would have been a lot less varied than the diet of wealthier Romans. And meat like even escargot or snails may not have been a, a, daily, uh, a daily thing. It may have been occasionally when you could afford it. And since I mentioned it on the previous slide, we'll talk a little bit about uh, pottery at Pompeii and at other uh, sites. The Romans, of course, used pottery like the Greeks. Uh, pottery was used for food storage, uh, to store wine, to store oil. And some Roman pottery is very simple without decorations. It's very utilitarian. Other elements of Roman pottery are uh, painted and glazed uh, to be more decorative. Generally speaking, the Romans would paint their ceramics after glazing which means that unfortunately the paint dissolves over time. Um, you see this quite a bit on the uh, terra sigillata uh, or terra sigillata um, examples of pottery. We'll look at some examples on the next couple of slides. And there's variations in style across the empire as well. And the Romans also would have imported uh, Greek style pottery. There's variations of, of older red and black figure styles made with different types of, of colors of clay, but on the whole, I would say that pottery made in the, uh, in the Roman style, like the terra sigillata, it's not as colorful as, as the pottery made uh, earlier by the Greeks. This could be because the paint just wears off over time. Um, this could be one explanation, but I think it's because the Romans, rather than focusing on the color of their pottery, they're much more interested in portraying uh, reliefs on their pottery basically raised art rather than uh, colors. But I'll show some examples on the next couple of slides. And these are some amphorae or uh, storage jars uh, from Pompeii on this slide. Here's some examples of Roman uh, pottery um, that would have been glazed. You can see that um, in terms of color, they're, they're fairly plain. Uh, the glazing here has come off with time, but it's been um, restored and added back to give you an idea of what it would have looked like when it was made. 
Um, these examples, the, um, they're from uh, Metz, France, uh, between the first century BC and the late second century CE. We see a Greco-Roman being, uh, deity, Nike, the goddess of victory, but you also see uh, designs that I think are probably of Celtic origin or Gaulish origin. So there are local uh, tastes being represented in Roman pottery as well. The Romans made other types of uh, figurines and ceramics as well. This is a figurine showing Aeneas uh, carrying his father Anchises and his uh, son uh, Eulus out of Troy. It's from Naples in about the first century CE. Naples, of course, is very close to Pompeii. And this is a, uh, a lamp, an oil lamp of, of gladiators, showing gladiators. Gladiators were very, uh, feature very prominently in Roman visual art. It's from um, Cologne, though, what is now Germany. And you can see the carbonization from olive oil that would have been burnt um, as a light source in this lamp. This is a good opportunity to talk about entertainment in ancient Rome. Entertainment, something that would have happened in big cities like Rome and in smaller cities like Pompeii. Uh, the Romans liked Greek style theater. They even had their own uh, theaters and plays and playwrights. They also liked athletic contests and chariot racing. These things were made popular in the Roman uh, civilization. Um, but far more so than the Greeks, the Romans enjoyed uh, blood sports and public executions. I think this is a hallmark of the more militaristic Roman society. Greek society was militaristic as well, but I don't think it was to the same degree that the Roman society was. Um, the Romans also enjoyed uh, mock hunts performed by uh, hunters called venators. They would kill uh, wild animals in uh, the arena for the entertainment of the crowds. The origin, though, of gladiatorial contests, um, the Romans, arguably their favorite form of entertainment, is unclear. Um, but they seem to be, have become a major part of the Roman culture by the time of the empire. We think that gladiatorial contests probably had taken place since at least 265 uh, BCE. Um, we don't know exactly where the Romans got gladiatorial contests from. We think they either perhaps learned them from the Greeks that lived in Magna Graecia in southern Italy, or perhaps they learned uh, gladiatorial fights from the Etruscans. But we think that the first gladiatorial contests probably took place at funerary banquets and they just become bigger uh, and more spectacular with time. And wealthy Romans, like politicians trying to get elected, victorious generals on triumph, even emperors would put on these festivals, these celebrations with gladiatorial fights and executions. And these events were called uh, ludi. Um, and in these events, poor Romans would eat, drink, and be merry. They would watch fights and be entertained. And wealthy Romans would put on these events and they were very extravagant and almost to the point of bankrupting themselves. Um, and they're going to become more extravagant and more expensive with time. Um, and these events, these festivals, they're part of the Roman system of patronage. Uh, they are um, uh, what one uh, Roman author called uh, Panem et Circenses, bread and circuses, that basically the Roman people expected this form of entertainment they expected uh, free food and uh, drinks. And these, these um, events were social events where Romans came together to be entertained, but they were also almost like a form of social welfare as well, paid for by wealthy Romans and paid for by the emperors as well to uh, provide for poorer Romans. They're part of that Roman system of obligation. And in exchange, the Roman people will not try to overthrow the Roman upper class. And these festivals, in addition to being about entertainment, they had strong uh, civil and religious connotations. Sacrifices would be made to the gods as well, and uh, the meat uh, would be fed to um, um, the poor. The Roman gods would be worshipped. Um, Worshipping the Roman gods is part of not just their religion of the Romans, but part of their civic culture. Uh, Roman emperors would be worshipped as well, although emperors were not worshipped in their own lifetime, or they weren't supposed to be. So entertainment, uh, gladiatorial fights, they held Roman society together, they gave wealthy Romans a chance to show their largesse to poor Romans, poor Romans were entertained by these events, and 
they were an important fixture in uh, Roman society. These are some uh, portrayals of uh, Roman entertainment. We see a marble relief of gladiators. Um, this is from 20 to 50 CE. And these mosaics here are gladiator and venator mosaics. They were found uh, at some very nice uh, villas outside of Rome. Uh, they were probably made in about the 300s uh, CE. And they show the different types of entertainment that was put on. Uh, venators hunting uh, looks to be a leopard of some kind and then the various classes of gladiators and the types of weapons and armor they would have worn. So now we'll dig into the gladiators a bit more, who they were and what they did. Gladiators typically were a type of slave. Um, there are some isolated reports of, of free Romans performing as gladiators, but the norm was that gladiators were slaves, especially um, capture slaves. Um, Gladiators lived and trained at um, a place called the Ludus. The Ludus was basically a gym. And a large portion of the gladiators were uh, non-Romans, especially uh, war captives, enemy soldiers that would have been captured in warfare and then set to perform for the entertainment of, of the Romans. And this, um, the ethnic identity of these gladiators is highlighted by the types of uh, weapons and armor they use. There's uh, Samnites. Uh, the Samnites were uh, an enemy of the Romans on the Italian peninsula. The uh, Thraces, or the Thracians. Uh, the Thracians, of course, were enemies of the Romans that were, were conquered as well. And typically, uh, gladiators were male, but there are there is evidence that uh, some female uh, gladiators existed. They were probably daughters of male gladiators, but generally speaking, the gladiators would have been male. And successful gladiators were still slaves, but if they were a successful, victorious gladiator who won their fights, they could live better lives and in some cases even be famous. Uh, but Roman society still looked down on them. They looked down on them the way they might look down on, on prostitutes. You might like a gladiator, you might have a picture of a gladiator, but you wouldn't want to invite that gladiator to your dinner party if you were a wealthy Roman. In these fights, uh, they were uh, they were supposed to be to the death, but usually they did not end with death. The crowds would determine whether the defeated gladiator uh, should be spared or finished finished off, and they would uh, put their thumbs up to spare and thumbs down for death. Usually, though, um, even though the crowd would um, sort of vote, um, the upper class or the most senior Roman in attendance at the event, up to the emperor, would have the final say, but the emperor would have to be careful because if he said the gladiator should die but the crowd said he should live, that could lead to a potential riot if um, he violated what the, uh, the audience wanted, the spectators wanted. And as I said, um, even though they were supposed to fight to the death, these fights typically did not end with death. And this may have been because uh, the crowds would take mercy, would take pity or have mercy, want to have mercy on a defeated but brave gladiator who may have lost but fought gallantly. Also, um, in the crowds would have been the owners of these gladiators who would not want to have a good gladiator who lost a fight just be killed. They'd be losing an investment. So we think that um, some of these fights, you know, even though they were supposed to be to the death, they actually would end with the gladiator being spared. Although it was still a, a hard life, a dangerous way of living, uh, gladiators and the, even the successful ones, uh, they typically died young. It was said that you were lucky to live to 30 if you were a gladiator. Because even if you didn't die in the arena, you might die later on from wounds or other injuries. And some famous uh, gladiators include Spartacus, who led a uh, very large um, slave revolt. Flamma was also a very famous uh, gladiator. Flamma was of Syrian ancestry, highlighting how many of the gladiators were uh, not ethnically Roman because they were captured. Um, but even the Emperor Commodus um, attempted, to, attempted to make himself a gladiator. He performed in the arena, much to the chagrin, much to the chagrin of, of wealthy Romans who thought it was improper for the emperor to be a gladiator. And of course, Commodus is assassinated, as, as you know from a previous video.
Here are some modern reenactors portraying uh, gladiators, a uh, Mermillo and a uh, Thrax or Thracian gladiator. Um, based on their armor, that's how we uh, know what, what type of gladiator they were. In the uh, back are what are called the Rudis, or um, basically the Rudis were like referees. They kept the gladiators from trying to run away or escape. Uh, so a lot like uh, referees, although referees nowadays try to prevent fights between players. In this case, the Rudies encouraged fights between the gladiators. They would stand at the edge of the fight with a, uh, a rod, and basically they would um, whip or hit any gladiator that, that tried to run away. This is the Circus Maximus of Rome. Uh, the tower here in the foreground is, is from medieval times. It's not original to the site. Uh, but uh, this is where chariot races would have taken place, and there would have been other events at the Circus Maximus as well besides just uh, chariot races. This is a mosaic of a charioteer from about the 300s uh, CE. This one is in uh, the National Museum of Art in Spain. And charioteers, like gladiators, usually they were slaves, and they were not very well regarded, even if they were in many ways celebrities. Uh, um, Elagabalus, who uh, was a Roman emperor not liked by the upper class, he had uh, relationships with charioteers, and that upset a lot of uh, a lot of wealthy Romans. Not just that he had those relationships with charioteers, but the fact that he had um, relationships with charioteers in a very taboo way, in which he, the um, the emperor, the dominant one, was actually the subordinate. So it gives you an idea about how. Roman society regarded charioteers. They regarded them a lot like the way they regarded gladiators. This is a uh, Roman chariot that was buried in a, uh, a grave. Uh, it's a two horse chariot. You can see one uh, horse here, another horse here. This grave would have belonged to a very, very wealthy Roman who could afford to have uh, two horses and a chariot buried in his grave. Um, it's from the 200s uh, CE as well. And on the right is the remains of a chariot from Pompeii, uh, circa 79 CE. And chariots, in terms of the Roman military, were not really used as much by the military uh, by the time of the uh, Roman uh, Empire. They were much more about racing, and then they were a status symbol for wealthy Romans. It's not like during the Bronze Age where chariots were basically like tanks on the battlefield. At this point, they're more just like race cars. Here is a recreation of what the Circus Maximus would have looked like. Uh, there would have been uh, you know, chariot races taking place here. This is, of course, a shot from uh, the movie Ben-Hur. And in that movie, it's... Uh, protagonist and his enemy, who is a Roman military officer, have a chariot race, which uh, it's a very entertaining scene, but it's not terribly historically accurate because to be a charioteer would have been basically to become a slave, and no one would want to uh, do that uh, in the Roman civilization unless they were someone who was kind of crazy like Commodus. This is the amphitheater of Pompeii, uh, where Pompeii um, residents would have gone for entertainment. It was built about the year 70 BCE, so it was over 100 years old when the, by the time that the city of Pompeii was abandoned. And it's the oldest surviving amphitheater in the Roman Empire. There's other uh, amphitheaters that are much larger, like the Colosseum, uh, but the Colosseum was built later. And this would have hosted gladiatorial bouts and uh, other forms of entertainment for the residents of Pompeii and Herculaneum. Basically, it's the local ballpark where people would have gone uh, for to watch sports, uh, like gladiators fighting. Upper-class Romans would have sat in the uh, front rows. They always got to sit in the front because that was the best seats with the best viewer. And then the poorer Romans would have come in, and they could have seen the upper-class Romans in the, the lower level. Basically, it's, it's not just about seeing, but being seen. Uh, poor Romans would have sat, would have been seated in the, the nosebleed seats up here where they can't. They see the upper class Romans uh, and they can see the event, but not nearly as well as the upper class Romans uh, down in the, the lower level. So the wealthy get a be much better view of the uh, fights. And people would have come and gone uh, using the vomitoria 
as mentioned before, it was not a place built specifically for vomiting, although maybe someone who'd had too much to eat might have done that. And this amphitheater has very good acoustics. It's actually been used for modern day concerts. Uh, artists like Frank, Frank Sinatra and Pink Floyd have even performed here. So it shows that the uh, Romans were very skilled builders and their buildings are still of use to us today. And uh, on the exterior of the building, um, there would have been plaster and paint, but there also would have been uh, graffiti and posters of gladiators as well to um, just like a modern day stadium or arena would have decorations of whatever sports team plays there. This is the entrance to the amphitheater, which at the time would have been covered with plaster and paint, but also with uh, graffiti and with uh, images of gladiators. You can see the Roman arches uh, that are being used. You can see the brick and the stone. So it's a very uh, well-built uh, building. Here are uh, some tourists in inspecting and touring the amphitheater site. Uh, this gives you an idea of just how large uh, this amphitheater is. While upper class Romans uh, were very um, quick to pay for entertainment and festivals for uh, working class Romans, they did not uh, pay for education for working class Romans. Um, they did not have a public education system in the ancient Roman civilization the way you see in uh, many modern countries today. Instead, elite people would have hired uh, slaves and in some cases free, free people to be the teachers and tutors of their children. And uh, Romans like to hire Greeks for this job. They like to hire free Greeks to teach their children Greek and to teach them about Greek culture. They also would purchase uh, Greek slaves to act as, as tutors for their, their children. Um, typically, they focused their educational efforts on their sons. Their sons would have learned reading, writing, some mathematics, history, and philosophy, as well as uh, rhetoric or public speaking. And many would have learned Greek as well. Uh, to be an educated Roman would have required that you uh, learn Latin as well as Greek. And uh, daughters were uh, generally not educated the same way that sons were, but we think that a lot of young uh, women and girls would listen in on their brother's lessons and would learn to read and write uh, basically by listening and by eavesdropping. Uh, Roman students would uh, practice their writing on uh, wax uh, tablets using uh, uh, pointy sticks called uh, stylus. Uh, these are a lot like chalkboards for uh, basically for writing practice. The, uh, the tablet would uh, be held to a fire, which would cause the wax to melt uh, and become smooth again for uh, lessons in the future. And so in spite of the Romans' hesitancy to democratize education, the Romans made many important innovations in the field of learning. Um, there were some very um, excellent uh, Roman authors, historians, philosophers, uh, who built on uh, previous knowledge made by the Greeks. But the Romans also, we believe, were the inventors of books, or what were called codexes, or codices. And the image on this slide is actually of the Greek uh, poet Sappho. We talked about Sappho and who she was in a, uh, a previous lecture, but perhaps the person that commissioned this uh, fresco was either a lover of Sappho's poetry or someone who just respected education, being that Sappho is portrayed with a tablet and uh, with a stylus. Here are some more examples of material culture, um, of education from the ancient Roman civilization. Uh, these are not uh, found specifically in, in Pompeii, but they're found in other parts of the empire, but they're relevant to our discussion of life in uh, the senatorial provinces. These styluses, or um, styli, they are um, actually from Londinium, or the, uh, they were discovered in Londinium, and they actually have a, a joke written on, on this uh, set of four. They say, you know, I got these, um, th this stylus set for you in the city, and the Romans generally referred to Rome as the city. And they were probably um, from about the year 70 CE. This is an example of a tablet. The wax is long since um, decomposed or is no longer there, but this, this center area would have had wax on it and Romans would have used the stylus to record on the wax. 
This is a, um, a codex, an early example of a book. Um, codexes or codices are much easier to use than scrolls. Um, you don't need uh, two hands to uh, turn um, a page. You just use uh, one hand to turn a page. But uh, a scroll would have required uh, more coordination to read. So we think the codex was developed because it was more convenient to use. And here we see a relief of uh, a teacher giving his students lessons. They're holding scrolls. The teacher has a philosopher's beard. Perhaps he's a philosopher who's teaching the students. And this is from about the 180s uh, CE from uh, Trier, what is now Germany. While we're on the subject of education and writing, we should talk about uh, graffiti in ancient Rome. Specifically, we'll look at some examples of uh, graffiti from Pompeii. Graffiti is common in Roman cities. There's all different kinds of writing on buildings. Uh, this writing, this graffiti is made by everyday Romans. So it gives us a window into the literacy of everyday Romans, what they were able to write. And it's very useful at getting a uh, idea of the daily life of Roman people. And because Pompeii was destroyed very suddenly, we, we get a really great image of the different kinds of graffiti that were used. There's graffiti that's much more ephemeral, that's much more temporary, and then there's graffiti that's meant to last a little bit longer. And graffiti, like middens or trash piles, it may have been a nuisance for Romans in some ways, but it can be very useful for us archaeologists and historians because it gives us an idea of what the Romans were thinking, what they were writing, um, and it's a source of writing from everyday Roman people because everyday Romans were not writing works of history and philosophy, but they would leave behind graffiti of their thoughts. And graffiti is epigraphic, but also ephemeral at the same time. Epigraphic is the study of inscriptions. Many works of graffiti are carved, uh, but also some works of graffiti are made with paints and ash, and they don't last nearly as long. So these inscriptions can last a long time, but they also show a window into what a Roman person was thinking at a specific moment as they were writing uh, something down. And what did the Romans write about in their graffiti? A lot of the same things that uh, people write about today, jokes, uh, innuendos, they would mock famous people, they'd mock religious figures, uh, there were political slogans, and really this graffiti, you can almost think of it as being the social media of the day. You know, you write on somebody's Facebook wall. Uh, now, or in ancient Rome, you would write on their literal wall, and they write all kinds of things. There's jokes that are very sexual, there's drawings that are very uh, sexual, there's jokes. Some jokes are very uh, scatological, a lot of what we might call bathroom humor. Uh, they they uh, leave what we might call like almost like a Yelp review at a restaurant. They'll say, don't eat the food at this restaurant, it'll poison you. They'll make fun of political figures, even Roman emperors. Uh, and there's also drawings that are graffiti as well. People will draw, as I said, very uh, sexual images, uh, pornographic images, but they also draw gladiators, for example, because the Romans liked gladiators. And there's evidence that both, or men, women, and children left graffiti. Uh, men might uh, draw an image of the, their favorite gladiator or their favorite politician. Women might write down, why won't my crush notice me? Why won't my husband uh, be more affectionate with me? Children will make graffiti as well, and you can see the literacy levels of people. Typically, graffiti left behind by children, the, the writing will be much more crude. It will not be adult handwriting, for example. So you can study the literacy of Romans. If they're very literate and they're writing um, a lot of different things down, if there's varied sentence structure, or if this is someone that can barely write their own name, uh, they're struggling with their, their handwriting, and if they're misspelling a lot of things, you can see the, uh, not just the literacy, but the ability that uh, Romans have with, with writing from graffiti. And even someone who may not be literate can still recognize that uh, other people can read. So you leave graffiti not just lying around, you leave it so that other people can read it. 
And the image on this slide is a uh, graffito. Graffito is the uh, singular for graffiti. Um, it's uh, political slogans, and it's from Pompeii. This is a form of uh, carved graffiti. And here we see um, uh, a graffito of a gladiator, presumably a uh, Samnite based on the, the shape of the shield. And he is facing off against another gladiator, although it's a little bit more difficult to tell what class of gladiator the other one is. The, it's not as clear as, as this, this one is. Here are some uh, pieces of graffiti of venators hunting animals. We see a couple of uh, hunters here. There's one here, there's one here. They seem to be hunting uh, deer, uh, goats, rams, um, a, a wild boar of some kind. And this looks like a, a bird of some kind, perhaps an eagle. So uh, there are many different types of animals that are being hunted. It gives us an example of what kind of animals uh, these venators would have, would have killed. Graffiti evidence can also be used to uh, date the destruction of Pompeii. Traditional documentary sources uh, like Pliny the Younger, um, a Roman scholar who wrote about the destruction of, of Pompeii, he suggested that Pompeii was destroyed in the late summer or early fall of the year 79 CE. But this very ephemeral charcoal graffito, a form of graffiti that was not meant to last forever, it's made with charcoal, it's not carved or painted, it has the date November 15th through 16th, um, suggesting that perhaps the uh, eruption was actually more in November, later in the year. And it's possible that this um, graffito was made by a Roman that was trapped in his or her home and was recording November 15th through 16th, the eruption of Pompeii, suggesting that this was um, the last thing that they wrote before they were, were killed by the eruption. And, but also it suggests that the eruption takes place in November, so a bit later than uh, what uh, other scholars had thought previously. We also have to discuss the people of, of Pompeii and Herculaneum who were killed in the Vesuvius eruption. We think about 2,000 people uh, died in uh, the Pompeii uh, eruption. There were about 16,000 or so people in the surrounding area, and thankfully most of those people escaped. We think that there were signs of a possible disaster, that there may have been some earthquakes, some unusual weather before the eruption, a lot of people left. And then once the uh, blast began, people um, would have run away down to the, uh, the coast to get away from uh, the city as well. And as time would have gone on, the ash that's being spewed in the air, the toxic gases that are being spewed in the air by the volcano, it would have lowered visibility and made uh, vision very difficult, it would have made breathing very painful. And certainly as the ash is following, uh, some of the ashes is in large like pumice stones. And if a piece of the pumice falls on you, you could be uh, injured. Um, observers of the, uh, the blast said that the ash blocked out the sun and made things very dark. Uh, and not dark like a dark night, dark like you're trapped in a room uh, with no light and all the windows closed. So the visibility would have been very, very low and it would have been very difficult to escape uh, once the blast began. But some, some people did escape fleeing to the coast. Other people, though, may have chosen to hide in their homes, and they either would have been suffocated by the ash and the toxic gases, or they would have been killed as the ash is caving in their, their homes, knocking out the, the first or the second level of their homes. And as they're dying from the ash, it's leaving behind their skeletal what remains, but also um, impressions where their bodies had been. And after the ash stopped, a uh, py pyroclastic flow would have flooded the city, uh, killing those who had not already suffocated. Um, and there would have been impressions left in the ash as well. And the Pompeii site was discovered in the uh, 1700s. And in the early 1800s, basically what we might call proto-archaeologists, they found these impressions with these bones and they filled them with concrete to try to recreate the poses of the dead in their final moments. These are not mummies, uh, not like ancient Egyptian mummies. These are 
skeletal remains with uh, concrete added. What they found were impressions. They didn't find like people turned to stone. But the proto-archaeologists were trying to kind of give the illusion of human statues. Archaeology at this point was not, it was not about trying to recreate uh, past societies and cultures scientifically. It was about uh, antiquarianism and um, creating um, interesting artifacts for people to see. And certainly these, these, um, these impressions, once they've been filled in, they're very interesting to look at. But archaeologists today would not uh, make something like this. They would view this as being um, uh, disrespectful to the remains of the deceased. And these, um, um, basically these filled impressions would make it more difficult to study the skeletal remains in the future. Although archeologists would not um, have done this sort of thing today, we can still learn from uh, the uh, filled in impressions that were made by those early proto-archaeologists. You can see the, the final poses uh, of these people in their last moments. You can see as they were uh, trying to struggle against the ash that's falling on them, their homes that are collapsing on them. Uh, we also see animals. Uh, we can see a, a horse that's been um, been forced onto the ground, showing the power of, of the ash that was falling. We can see a dog trying to wrestle its way out of a chain. Perhaps this was a guard dog of some kind. So while archaeologists may not have uh, done this today, we can still learn from uh, what these proto-archaeologists did with these remains in the 1800s. Here are some more examples of uh, the impressions that were filled in. You can see the skeletal remains um, that were uh, belonged to the, the Romans that were killed at Pompeii. We generally think that those who did not run away were uh, probably the very young and the very old. Uh, this um, this was a uh, this impression in skeletal remains probably belonged to a child that was about four years old. Uh, certainly, a young child would have had a very difficult time escaping. Uh, the people uh, these people were probably older people or people who were uh, ill, who may have decided that instead of escaping the storm or escaping the eruption. They would try to ride it out, and in doing so, they ended up uh, being killed. Uh, we can also see that um, the uh, skeletal remains of uh, these people, they had good teeth when they were alive, too. These are the dead, um, or the skeletal remains of people that died at uh, Herculaneum. There's about 300 skeletons were found in uh, boathouses down by the water. We think that some of the Herculaneum residents who were not able to escape completely from the, the, the city, they went and hid in these boathouses. Uh, and uh, the way that these people died is different than how the, uh, the Pompeii residents died. Uh, we think that these uh, people were killed by high heat, high temperatures. They were not killed by, by ash. There's debate, though, about how quickly uh, they died and how hot the uh, hot gases that were coming out of uh, Mount Vesuvius were. Some people think that they were uh, basically vaporized. Their flesh uh, and uh, bodily fluids are basically turned to vapor, leaving these skeletal remains behind that they would have died very quickly, probably instantly. Others though, especially more recent uh, scholars, think that the dead actually probably um, died more slowly, probably over the course of several minutes which of course would be a horrifyingly painful way to die, uh, being burned to death. Um, but archaeologists can learn a lot from these remains. And certainly if um, the remains, if people were, were killed more slowly, there will be more um, organic tissues and things left behind that uh, archaeologists may be able to study to learn more about these people's final moments and more about their, their daily lives before the eruption. On the left-hand side of this slide is uh, one skeleton belonging to a woman in her 40s uh, with uh, rings and um, uh, bracelets. Uh, her remains are often called those of the ring lady. You can see very expensive uh, rings with a, a ruby and gold bracelets. This is someone who would have been uh, fairly wealthy. But it gives you an idea of uh, how the people of Herculaneum tried to escape the destruction of their city and how ultimately they fail to survive. This is a uh, um, 
18th century painting of the Vesuvius eruption. And uh, this is a, uh, this slide shows how far the ash uh, would have spread beyond the eruption. So it spreads out uh, several kilometers away from uh, Mount Vesuvius. And it was said that it made the ocean around, um, around uh, the Mount Vesuvius very chaotic, large waves. This made rescue efforts very difficult. Um, Plenty of the Younger's uh, adopted father was a naval officer, and he tried to take his ship to, um, um, to the coast to try to rescue um, people who had fled Pompeii and Herculaneum, but he ended up being killed uh, by the gases. So it gives you an idea of the devastation that was caused by the Mount Vesuvius eruption. It was not confined just to Pompeii and Herculaneum, but other areas, uh, the, certainly the ocean, saw the effects of uh, the eruption. So now that we've discussed Roman daily life in Pompeii, we've discussed some other elements of Roman material culture, we've discussed elements of Roman uh, fashion, uh, gender norms, uh, Roman ideas of race and ethnicity, I want to uh, broaden our discussion to include life in the Roman imperial provinces as well. These are more remote provinces further away from the Roman uh, cultural heartland. And uh, provincial Romans, they would have enjoyed some of the benefits of being in the Roman Empire. Security uh, via the Roman legions who protected them from attacks from non-Romans. The infrastructure that was built by the Romans, aqueducts, roads, etc. And of course, trade with other parts of the Roman Empire. And eventually, these provincial residents uh, would be given the rights of citizens with the Edict of Caracalla. These Romans on the frontier, they would practice some elements of their culture. Um, and some Romans, especially Roman soldiers who were stationed in these provinces for security on the frontier, they even adopted elements of local and indigenous culture. For example, uh, Roman soldiers really liked to worship uh, the Persian god Mithras. Uh, this was a Persian deity, but they learned to worship uh, Mithras from uh, local people. So there's an element of cultural syncretism that's taking place on the frontier. There's also the uh, Fayum mummy portraits. Uh, these are Greco-Roman style portraits affixed to uh, mummies. Um, the Romans typically, Roman culture did not encourage mummification, it encouraged the cremation of the dead. But people living in Egypt, including we think ethnic uh, Roman people, may have adopted mummification in Egyptian tradition, but they would then have Greco-Roman style portraits affixed to their uh, mummies. So it's cultural syncretism in, in the frontier areas. Although uh, non-Romans would still have to adopt elements of Roman culture, they would have to learn to speak the Latin language or at least learn how to speak Greek. Uh, the Romans also used Greek as a uh, language uh, for business uh, in addition to Latin, and they would have had to pay taxes to Rome. And not everyone who lived in the Roman Empire wanted to be in the Roman Empire. Some cultures, especially the Jewish culture, for example, did not want to be in the Roman Empire. They wanted to be independent. Roman culture was not compatible with Jewish culture. The Jewish people were monotheists. The Romans were polytheists. So there was revolts in many cases in the Roman provinces. So the provinces can be a place of peace and of cultural syncretism, but they can also be a place of, of rebellion as well. And there's the mixing of cultures, Romans adopting elements of these local indigenous cultures, but then local and indigenous people adopting elements of Roman culture, although Oftentimes, this adoption is taking place under duress. This is the Lullingstone Villa uh, in Kent, England. It was built and used uh, from the 100s CE. Uh, the main part of the Lullingstone house is from the 300s uh, CE, but then there's going to be some renovations and, and uh, expansions after the 300s CE. We'll focus on the earlier parts of uh, the site in, in this video. There's Roman style tile on the roof, but then um, there's local style uh, stone masonry and um, uh, materials being used. Uh, the Romans certainly preferred to build with brick and concrete. They used some plaster as well, but the stone and plaster this side is much more of a um, sort of local tradition. So there is some modification. There is some cultural syncretism being shown at this site. The floor plan is also slightly different. Um, there is an atrium, 
um, but there's, uh, it's much more closed off. This is probably because of the colder climate. Um, instead of having the atrium at the front of the house, the atrium is more in the middle where it would have been warmer. And the site does undergo a uh, major renovation uh, later in its use. Basically from the 300s on, there's some serious renovations that take place. I'll talk about why those renovations take place in a future video. This is a uh, diorama uh, showing the floor plan of the Lullingstone Villa. As mentioned before, the atrium is more in the middle of the house because it would have been warmer in the middle of the house. There is a porch though, so perhaps during the summer months they would sit outside on the porch, but then in the colder winter months, uh, you know, the harsh um, uh, English uh, British climate, they would they would want to stay in the uh, the interior of the atrium. You'll see there are uh, pools and things like that uh, where the uh, inhabitants of this villa could have bathed and, and taken care of uh, uh, washing and things like that. This, this villa would have belonged to a wealthy uh, Roman landowner and he would have had his clients come to uh, the villa to receive their orders, what they were supposed to do during the day. Uh, and uh, they would receive gifts from the, from, that, from the patron, from the landowner. So many elements of Roman culture, patronage can be seen in uh, how this building is designed. But there are some differences as well. Uh, the atrium is deeper in the building and uh, it's used, uh, it's built with local materials as opposed to traditional Roman building materials. Here are some Romano-Egyptian mummy portraits from uh, the Fayum region in Egypt. And dating these portraits can be difficult because when they were initially excavated before archeology span was a more professionalized field, the portraits were separated from the mummies. And, uh, but archeologists and the historians have worked hard to study these portraits. And when they're not attached to their mummies, they've actually been able in many cases to date when these portraits would have made, that is, the portraits are made after uh, the subject had already died. So we can get an idea of when these people would have been alive. Uh, roughly speaking, this is basically, it's a form of absolute dating. We can tell from what years roughly uh, they, they are made, but that's not super precise. You're, you're going, uh, there's gonna be some varying uh, in, in when uh, these portraits were made based on the styles that are shown. And again, it's easier to date uh, images of women because women's fashion changes more quickly. From the left to the right, this is a uh, portrait of a uh, male um, Romano-Egyptian person. This one was made uh, probably before the 100s uh, CE based on the style, the hairstyle, the lack of facial hair on uh, the portrait. This uh, one is from a little bit later, from perhaps the 100s, the early 300s CE, because of the fact that the, uh, the subject has a beard and has a little bit of a longer hairstyle. Skin color on these uh, portraits varies. Some have darker skin, others have lighter skin. It could be that because uh, there are uh, people who are uh, of North African or Egyptian ancestry with darker skin and there's people of uh, Roman uh, ancestry or from more Northern parts of the empire who are migrating to Rome. We see a lot of variety. Remember, Rome is a multi-ethnic civilization and uh, it's a multiracial civilization as well. In the portraits of Roman women, they're a little bit easier to be uh, dated because of the fact that uh, Roman women's styles change more frequently. The image on the left is from the 100s to 120s uh, CE, and it's a very uh, ornate um, portrait. Uh, the woman, uh, the female subject has a lot of jewelry, a necklace, earrings, a crown. The image uh, on the right is probably from the 300s CE, and it could be that this is a woman that's not as wealthy as the woman on the, uh, more on the left. But it also could be that um, this is because styles were changing by the 300s. Roman women's hairstyles by the 300s were a little bit more subdued and understated. As I said, styles change, and we can use uh, changing styles to date these uh, portraits. We can't be 100% certain but we can um, get fairly close. We can estimate fairly close. And this is a form of absolute dating. Um, we're assigning an actual date to these uh, portraits. It's not relative dating. One is older than the other. 
Um, so that's just how we might use uh, styles to date uh, various artifacts. Conclusion, there's some very important trends in everyday life in the Roman Empire from 27 BCE to about 235 CE. We see the culture of virtue and obligation, obligation to Rome, to the empire, but also obligation to one's fellow Romans. Uh, patrons have obligations to their clients. Clients have obligations to their patrons. Poorer people and slaves lived uh, more difficult lives than upper class Romans. But they received many benefits from the elite patrons, uh, military security, infrastructure, uh, food, entertainment, and, and social welfare from upper class Romans. And these systems of obligation in which the patrons, the upper class, provided things for the, the clients, the poor Romans, and the poor Romans provided their obedience, they provided military service, they provided uh, taxes and labor, the system worked as long as the systems of obligation worked. Um, but these systems became increasingly expensive and complex with time. And uh, this is also going to be complicated in uh, more uh, remote provinces where there are ethnic Roman people and then there's uh, non-Roman uh, subjects as well. Um, non um, Roman provincial people will eventually be given Roman citizenship, but over time what you see is that these systems of obligation will begin to break down. And they don't just break down because of bad policies by uh, Roman emperors who spend too much, who debase the currency. They just break down because Romans of other classes just can't afford or don't want to take part in them anymore. And you see that this breakdown of obligation is going to accelerate as time goes on. There's problems in the late 100s and early 200s, but things are really gonna get bad after the year 235 when the crisis of the 200s begins.